Welcome back to Uncharted X. This is Ben, and I hope you're all well. We're going to be doing something a little different today. This isn't one of my normal scripted videos. Instead, it's a version of the presentation that I gave recently at the Cosmic Summit conference. It's about the evidence for ancient high technology, something I've been calling a tale of two industries. I really wanted to put this out on my channel as a thank you to all of the viewers and subscribers and supporters of the work that I've been doing over the last few years. I really wouldn't have even been able to give this presentation at the Cosmic Summit if it weren't for all you guys. And I wanted to make sure it was available for everybody to see and not just stuck behind a paywall. This isn't scripted. I wanted to take my time and go through this material thoroughly. It's quite a bit longer than the version that I gave at the Cosmic Summit in only about an hour and a half. So I really hope you enjoy it. Just a quick note before I get started here that I will be joining Randall Carlson on a Mega Floods of the Ice Age tour in Montana in September of 2023. And if you're interested in joining us on that trip, check out the links below in the description. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Cheers. Essentially, this is the topic we're covering today is, is something I'm calling a tale of two industries. It's the evidence for ancient technology, primarily focused in Egypt, although for sure this is something we could extend to South America and, and many other places around the world. First of all, who am I? Uh, most of you should know. <laughs> my name is Ben. Yeah, the rest of my name is Van Kirkwick. I'm an Australian uh, by origin. I'm an expatriate. I've been living in the USA for ooh, nearly 18 years now. Uh, prior to embarking on this strange career as a, a YouTuber and an independent researcher. I had a 20 year career in the network world as essentially a, a network architect, a technologist. I spent the last sort of almost decade of that working in the chief technology of or, or CTO office, the chief technology office for Hewlett Packard. Uh, and this has really shaped a lot of my perspectives around technology. I did a lot of uh, technology planning uh, you know, long-term technology strategy, R&D investment, mergers, acquisitions. Uh, you know, I was essentially an individual contributor creating technological architectures. I've got a couple of patents, things like that. It was a fun career, but uh, this career and this topic, this area is of much more interest to me. I've always been a fan of history. Uh, I've been a student of it for a long time. I nearly went that direction uh, when I was in university, but obviously decided there was more money to be made in the IT side of things. So I went that way, but I never lost my interest in it. My mother was a history teacher, and I, just, you know, I really got started on this when I had the chance to to meet Graham Hancock. His his work, Fingerprints of the Gods, was a big influence on me. And then in 2013, I had the chance to to meet and travel with him through Peru and Bolivia. Um, and then again in 2015, I was in Egypt uh, for the first time for me, and that was on a tour also with Graham Hancock. That was also the the source of the famous debate, if you've ever seen it, uh, between Graham Hancock and uh, Zahi Hawass. There's some clips of that on the internet. And after that, I was like, man, damn, there's, 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 a, there's a lot here to explore. Uh, there's a lot here to try and share with people. And that's pretty much shortly after that is, is when I started going full time uh, and pursuing these mysteries and investigating these things full time. All of my work's published on YouTube, also on UnchartedX.com. I'm also on several other platforms now. I'm on Spotify, I'm on Rumble. And uh, you can find my work all over the place, but essentially my website is where everything is always published. So where the best place to start with this, I think, is a grounding in what is the orthodox story of history. So what is our perspective on human civilization, on evolution of our species, and how did we get to where we are today? And I'd like to start this with kind of a, a I guess it's you would call it the standard model view as it was, you know, nearly 20 years ago now roughly you know in the in 2006 this was a new scientist article that was that was published 2006 and talking about the timeline of human evolution and this pretty much represented the the, the view of of civilization the history of humans and civilization and it really has not changed very much since then but this was pretty much how how we've been looking at it for a long time now uh, it starts around 195,000 years ago which is when our own species homo sapiens first seemed to appear on the scene uh, after that, we began to migrate across Asia and Europe. This was determined by, you know, carbon-14 dating of, at the time, the oldest modern human remains, which were skulls found in Ethiopia. Uh, and roughly, call it 200,000 years ago is when they think our species first appeared on the scene. 50,000 years ago was the great leap forward, the, I guess, almost the beginnings of, of culture and religion when we started to ceremonially, ceremonially bury our dead do things like create, you know, clothes from animal hides, 
develop complex hunting techniques, things like that. It also corresponds with the date that they think was the first colonization of Australia by modern humans. 12,000 years ago is when it is thought that humans first reached the Americas. Uh, this is also often considered or talked about as the, the Clovis people or the Clovis boundary. Uh, it is It has long been held as a a fairly strong doctrine in archaeology that there were that there were no humans in the Americas prior to this date of twelve thousand years ago, and then around ten thousand years ago we start to see the beginnings of agriculture. Uh, it, this this spreads from you know the the, the the verdant sort of crescent valley and the the, the top of Mesopotamia, uh, and and we start to see the development of with agriculture you get villages you get specialization you get the progression of human culture that eventually leads towards civilization. Uh, there have been several advances uh, in, these, in, this, in the dating of agriculture since then. Roughly after this period, 4,000 to 3,500 BC, or if we go with the same terminology, the rest of it, 6,000 to 5,500 years ago, the Sumerians of Mesopotamia developed what is thought to be the world's first civilization. So really only a brief period of time from where we stand today. Uh, the Sumerians begin it, and of course they are closely followed by people like the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Roman, the Chinese, and civilization spreads across the world, essentially putting us on a path to where we stand today. And this is, this is the standard model of history, and really this hasn't changed very much uh, since this article was published in 2006, particularly dates like the beginnings of civilization. If you think about it in this, in, in the overall timeline of humans, it, it really isn't a very long time. And, and you can pretty much phrase it like this, as, in, as if we've gone from the Stone Age to the Space Shuttle in only 6,000 years. Gone from riding on caves to some very advanced technology spreading out into space in a really short period of time when you look at the overall timeline um, of the human species. An interesting part of this is that I do think that this this idea that we've we've gone from essentially cavemen in the Stone Age to our modern society is is a a tenant of what it means to be a modern human in today's world. This is a it's it's a concept that's baked into all of us. It's 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 not you know not everybody knows every you know the, the the process or the path that this took in detail, but it's certainly something that we're told. Like this is inbuilt into us with our education system we're told that you know our, our civilization has emerged from this stone age it's you know obviously there's been ancient civilization there's been ups and downs but essentially it's been this more or less linear path to civilization and that civilization as we know it this is the way to do it we're the only you know advanced civilization and this has only happened in the most recent millennia of human existence on this planet uh, it, it really forms the uh, core tenet in, in what it means to be a modern human today. And I think it's a really important concept. We're going to come back to this at the end of the presentation and, and maybe examine what it might be like if we could change this concept. So what's happened since 2006 and since we've had this standard model of history? Well, there's been a lot of, a lot of vectors that are really pressuring and, and forcing, or at least should be forcing some change on what you might call that standard model of history that we've just been through. And these vectors are coming from multiple different directions. We're going to briefly cover some of these and then focus on, on mainly on the, the evidence for ancient technology, uh, which is one of these vectors, but that, that's certainly not the only one. Uh, we see changes and new discoveries happening in archaeology that should be having a, a massive effect on the standard model of history and certainly that of human civilization. There's been a lot of advances in science and discoveries that relate to the human timeline itself. There's DNA evidence that folds into that. Uh, obviously, we have our origin stories, which is a, a whole component of this and a lot of the modern science that's happened in the last 20 years is really showing that there are grains of truth in the origin stories that we see from cultures all around the world. And then, of course, a really big one, I think the key that unlocks all of this information, that unlocks all of these possibilities, is cataclysm. We've discovered the, the actual truth of real cataclysm that's occurred in the recent past, particularly with the, the work of the Comet Research Group and discovering the, the effects and the impacts and the airbursts of the period known as the Younger Dryas period, which we'll talk about briefly. Starting off with archaeology, there's obviously one of the, the very big discoveries that most people should be aware of is that there's been a tremendous amount of discoveries happening in Turkey. And this started with the site known as Gobekli Tepe, which is located in uh, southeastern Turkey, uh, near the modern city of Şanlıurfa, which was the biblical Edessa, the city of prophets, 
also known as Urfa at some point. It's it's part of the, you know, it's the northern end of what was Mesopotamia. That city's been there for thousands and thousands of years. It's it's a it's a holy city for many religions as it deals with a lot of the characters from the Old Testament. And close to this site, they discovered, it were originally discovered in the 1950s, this site of Gobekli Tepe. Funnily enough, in the 50s, this site was dismissed as being farm, you know, they didn't... They didn't think it was very ancient because the architecture was too good, so it wasn't really investigated. And it wasn't until work started in the late 1990s by the German Archaeological Institute that they started to uncover this site and dig down and found out that, no, in fact, this site is tremendously ancient. And, in fact, it's much more ancient than we had thought. And it's certainly much more ancient than any dates for civilization. It's been firmly carbon-14 dated uh, to at least 12,000 years old. So we're talking 10,000 B.C., for this site it's a massive megalithic site if you've not seen it i got the chance to visit it myself uh earlier this year in 2023 uh they've only uncovered some five maybe ten percent of the site there there is huge amounts yet to be uncovered i'm not sure if they're ever going to but they've been scanning it and they know the site extends a lot further than than what is currently uncovered it consists of a, a number of stone circles some of these stone circles, recent studies have shown that the circles themselves are arranged in very interesting geometric patterns. Some of them form equilateral triangles. Uh, many of these circles also have alignment properties in terms of aligning to uh, significant celestial events, things like solstices and equinoxes. The stone circles themselves are really interesting in their construction because they consist of, many of them consist of these very large single piece T pillars. These are made from a, a hard form of limestone. Some of them are, are just massive. They're, they're, they range up in size from 15 tons, 20 tons. Some of them are even up to 18 feet tall. There's a couple of really good reconstructions of these pillars uh, in the Shenlofa Museum in the city of Shenlofa. And it's not just stone circles that we found at this site. It's buildings, quarries, we have stone cut cisterns. There's, there is signs of occupation and what you might term civilization here. Uh, as I said, a lot of these circles and their properties are astronomically aligned. The work of Martin Sweatman has suggested that the figures on the, that are carved into the stone pillars might represent a celestial calendar. And there, there was a thought at some point that this was deliberately buried, although the science and the research on this is starting to shift that opinion. What I'd say is most interesting about Gobekli Tepe is when you look at the way it's been buried or it's been covered in, you can clearly see two forms of construction here. Right, There, there is a sophisticated form of stonework in the monoliths themselves and in their carvings. And then there is a much more primitive version that, that really makes up the walls that encompass these these stone circles. Uh, and the interesting thing to me is that the carbon-14 dates and the way that they've actually dated this site comes from material that they found in the walls. It's not specifically other material or anything on the ground. They found organic material in these walls. And that those walls, we know, were built in that, in that 12,000 year ago period. What's interesting to me is that in a lot of cases, these walls encompass the pillars, like they actually cover up previously made details on the pillars. And in some places here, you can actually see chunks of broken pillars that have been used as, as stones in the walls themselves. And this is certainly suggestive of a, of a much later period and a more primitive period of building. Maybe it was used to restore and renovate the site, to repair it, to protect it. Uh, we don't really know, but I think there, there, there's very likely a, a much longer story to this site and one that, that encompasses a couple of different periods of building and of occupation. Gobekli Tepe itself, you know, this was thought to have been just a, a revolution uh, in terms of ancient history. It was kind of a bombshell at the time that it dropped on us. And it, it wasn't received that way within the, the sort of the mainstream archaeological community, although there are a few dissenting perspectives on this. I particularly, after looking at the site and investigating it, and also I think this opinion shared by people like Graham Hancock, this is to me a pretty clear indication of, of civilization. Like you need specialization in order to develop stonework of this magnitude and the size and scope of the site. You need you need people to be able to, to specialize in their crafts in terms of feeding. You need community. You need society. You need civilization in order to build something like this and build it on this scale. But, you know, rather than actually changing that 6,000-year-old date of civilization, uh, instead, and if you can still see this on the Wikipedia page for Gobekli Tepe, 
Instead, they, they just changed the definition of what it meant to be a hunter-gatherer because in the past, doing megalithic stonework in you know, blocks up to 20 tonnes was not included as an activity that they thought that you know, hunter-gatherer tribes and nomadic people did. But now, apparently, this was purely a ceremonial site for, for hunter-gatherers. I think this is complete nonsense. Uh, but that's how it's been treated, and that date of civilization remains firmly established at around 6,000 years old. Uh, on its own, I think Gobekli Tepe is, is significant evidence for a much older date for civilization, potentially vastly older when you consider the different phases of occupation here. But what's happened in recent years, and I'm talking the last five or six years, I think should really be challenging uh, this perspective on civilization because it turns out Gobekli Tepe is not, not even close to being the only site that's now been discovered in this part of Turkey. Another site was uncovered and found nearby it's very close to Gobekli Tepe. It's older than Gobekli Tepe. The, the dating that has come back from this site it establishes it at at least 500 years older than Gobekli Tepe. It's known as Karahan Tepe. It shares a, an architecture with Gobekli Tepe. There is a lot of these, these pits that are dug down to bedrock. You see shapes that are formed out of the bedrock. This is actually a much bigger site than Gobekli Tepe. It's five times larger, as far as we know. It's only the excavations here have only just begun in recent years. So far, we've d discovered at least 250 T-pillars on the site. There might be up to 1,000 T-pillars on this site. And I also visited this site in early 2023, and there's actually a T-pillar that's still in a quarry. Like, it was never detached from the bedrock, but this T-pillar must have weighed probably about 30 tons. It's a huge piece and in fact on this image you can see here those piles of rocks in the center of this enclosure they're actually t-pillars that have fallen down and then they have eroded they've fallen apart and i don't know how much time it would have taken for this to happen before the site was eventually covered and buried in sediment but you know we don't really know how actually old this site is and what's even more impressive now is that these aren't the only sites that they found in southeastern Turkey, there is many other sites now coming to light that that you know uh, institutions and archaeologists have started looking for them. In fact, forty to eighty more sites just like these are now coming to light. It starts to become pretty ridiculous to suggest that well, no, these are just ceremonial hunter gatherer sites that you know these guys were 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 working on on the weekends in order to get away from the women and children. When you start talking about you know forty to eighty of these types of installations all over the place, and some of them are truly massive in scale. Uh, it's clearly indicative that there, there's been a huge chapter of human civilization that's that's been lost to us, that we know nothing about. And I can only equate it and compare it to the, uh, the similar set of discoveries that are happening uh, in the Amazon basin, thanks to deforestation and overhead LIDAR scannings, we're seeing the same sort of thing emerging from the Amazon. Tremendous, the evidence for tremendous cities, huge earthwork, um, installations just just a whole chapters and completely lost episodes of human civilization that happened at went we don't know when but certainly a long time ago and i think these sites in southeastern turkey should really be shaking up what we think of as the the earliest dates for human civilization not only that, but the Clovis Doctrine in the in North America, in the North American states and, and South, South America, has been um, severely challenged over the last 20 years. This The, the Clovis Doctrine, if you like, this date of 12,000 years, was the, the earliest time that we saw humans in the Americas. There's now you know more than half a dozen sites that have really um, challenged this, that are, are using techniques like carbon-14 dating. In particular, the Bluefish Cave site, which is in the Yukon, uh, it shows that there were humans working on this site and, and doing things at this site 10,000 years earlier than that, so roughly you know 25,000 years ago. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different sites that are suggestive, suggestive of this. Unfortunately, there was a very strong doctrine uh, associated with this, this Clovis First concept in the Americas and in the Archaeological Institute. And in fact, uh, Jean Sink Mars, who was the discoverer of Bluefish Cave, was actually run out essentially of the academic in um, um, environment, be be just basically laughed out of the room every time he suggested this uh, by his colleagues. And it caused him, you know, he was depressed by it. It, it caused him a lot of personal problems. Uh, it's, it's really unfortunate to see the resistance that was put forth to what is, in fact, you know, really strong new evidence that humans have been in this part of the world for a lot longer than were originally established. But 
as of this point, there, there are more and more sites coming up that are showing, no, in fact, there, there is evidence for human occupation in the Americas long before the 12,000-year-old uh, the Clovis Doctrine. The timeline of human evolution itself is changing. We were at around 200,000 years old with the skulls found in Ethiopia. There was now a jawbone that's been found in Morocco that was carbon dated to 300,000 years ago, so instantly adding another 100,000 years to the timeline of the human species itself. This is essentially, you know, walking, talking humans. If you shave them down and put some clothes on them, they wouldn't look any different to you and I. But now the actual fossil record, as far as we know, is shifted back to 300,000 years ago. And the story gets even stranger when you start to look at some of the new science involving teeth morphology and DNA. There's been a study done in a recent study in 2019 looking at the morphology of teeth of tooth evolution essentially we're looking at now that the divergence that neanderthals being our cousins essentially we and the neanderthals diverged from a common species at some time in the past and in order for us to to get the teeth that we have in that short period of time you know our teeth would have had to evolve at just a, a much higher rate than was in, was expected but the research has found that this isn't the case and that in fact dental evolution rate happens very slowly. So statistical analysis on this research, uh, on this data, essentially suggests that the divergence of from a common ancestor that creates essentially Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalus, the, our, our cousins, happened at least 800,000 years ago. So that's we're now pushing back the timeline for the human species itself to somewhere around 800,000 years. And in fact, this is also supported by DNA research. So looking at the DNA itself, looking at when did we diverge from a common ancestor with the Neanderthals. There was a paper published in 2003 that put that date at somewhere in the range of 631 to 790,000 years ago. So if you want to round up, you can say, I think the window for human beings on this planet might, might be up to a million years of time, certainly 800,000 years of time on the planet. That's a long cry from the 200,000 years that we originally thought. I mean, prior to that, we thought we were about 50,000 years old as a species. And now we're going back into periods of time that, that go far you know, beyond the, the glacial maximum of what we think of as the last ice age. It goes back into periods of warmth. There is tens of thousands of years of... of upheaval and cataclysm in amongst all of that and something i always like to say is that if you give human beings enough food to eat in warm weather we start solving problems and I, I think this opens up the window for all sorts of potential previous chapters of potentially civilization uh, way back within these periods not just you know fifteen thousand years ago but potentially hundreds of thousands of years ago the evidence for this type of sophistication in the human genome has also been shown by genetic studies that were, were revealed recently looking at the the affinities between different haplogroups so different ethnic groups of people from around the world and what this map is showing you here with the red dots is that there it's been discovered that there is a deep affinity that exists between the people of australasia and the peoples of south america now you'll notice that this red these red dots don't extend from South America up into Central and North America. And this is a, a real problem for the proposed diaspora of humanity and, and the way that human beings starting in Africa and going across Asia and then down into the Americas through the, the Bering Land Bridge, down through North America, Central America, and eventually hitting South America. Uh, if that was the case, we would see this genetic markers and these affinities in North America and in Central America. We just don't see that. What we do see is an affinity that stretches across the Pacific Ocean, which is the largest body of water on the planet. And it's suggestive, it's very suggestive of a large migration that must have occurred at some point deep in the past that left these genetic indicators that we're now finding today. It's, it, it's, it's showing that our history as a, as a race is much more complex than we had originally thought. Then, of course, the key that unlocks it all for me and for many people, I think, is the discovery of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. This was speculated about in Graham Hancock's work from 1995, Fingerprints of the Gods. This wasn't really discovered scientifically until around 2007 when the first, uh, the first papers were started to be published when scientists were actually, they were actually using Clovis sites that went back to 12,800 years old in the strata and by analyzing these different layers in the strata, they found 
all of this evidence for what you would call impact proxies. Essentially, the signatures that are left from cosmic airbursts and extraterrestrial impacts, and it's all shown in this what's called a black mat layer that we found now all over the world, North America, Europe, South America, even South Africa, we found evidence for this black mat layer as well as impact proxies, things like shock synthesized nano diamonds, extraterrestrial platinum and iridium. It's very indicative of a massive cataclysm and it correlates to a period in time that's called the Younger Dryas. And this stretches from 12,800, 900 years old years ago to around 11,600 years ago. There has been many sites and, and more than 50 now sites around the world. There's something like 150 plus peer-reviewed scientific papers that are now supporting this evidence. And it's not only supported by these impact proxies, but it's also shown with the research that's gone into ice cores. So these samples of ice cores that we take from places like Antarctica or Greenland or Russia, we're getting very good at the analysis of, of looking at the different basically yearly accumulations of ice. So every year when, when the snow lands and it freezes to ice, it captures things, you know, levels of oxygen isotopes, things like that, that can help us to, to, to determine temperature and, you know, was how much of the world was on fire, <laughs> things like this. And, and those ice cores have been very, very helpful in, in showing the, the true sort of climatic history of the planet. And it shows that, you know, we're warming up from the last glacial maximum, but at around that 12,900 year time frame, we just get plunged back very rapidly to the depths of glacial cold. And that exists uh, for a period of nearly a thousand years up until 11,600 years ago, a little bit longer, in fact. And then we're sort of shocked back out of that. And it comes up uh, and we sort of continue on this path of gradual warming and enter the Holocene, which is the, the era we're in today, which, you know, if you look at the, the history of temperatures and, and, and climatic conditions on the planet, we've, we've really had a, a you know, a 10 or 12,000 year period of, of what is can only be termed very nice weather, uh, certainly relative to the past. Now, as part of those ice core samples, we also found some other amazing indications of just catastrophic events that happened during the Younger Dryas. One of those was indicative of up to 9% of the biomass of the planet being on fire, which is just an absolutely mind-boggling number when you think about how much that, that, that means. There's actually these soot particles in the layers uh, from those years that show that there were tremendous fires all around the world. This period of time also corresponds with what you would call the great, the last great extinction event, the megafauna that existed in particularly North and South America and, and, and Europe, the mastodons, the mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, direwolves, just a huge number of, of species, these species, these large animals, megafauna or anything, I think that's over around 40 kilograms in body weight, almost you know half of the species that were around at that period, they, they all went extinct within a very short period of time. This also corresponds with this Younger Dryas boundary right around this date. So something traumatic happened. And, you know, all of the science that's now happened in the last 20 years is pointing to a series of cosmic airbursts and impacts, uh, likely as part of, you know, a disintegrated um, comet that, that forms an asteroid belt around, around the sun. It's called the Torrid Meteor Stream. We pass through it twice a year. And it seems likely that that may have been the source for uh, for this debris that the, the planet ran into and caused this tr tremendous cataclysm. Although it's not tightly coupled with it, it was probably also a precipitating event that caused sea levels to rise some 400 feet since that time, since the last glacial maximum. Uh, so the, the surface of the planet really changed dramatically as a result of this. And I could safely say that should this type of event happen today, it would be a civilization ender. Uh, the way of life as we know it would be over. Uh, our cities would be empty. There would be a massive depopulation of humans. Uh, I should also say that there is corresponding DNA evidence in the human genome to, that, that, that corresponds with the Younger Dryas. There was a drop in population as well as genetic diversity that happened across the planet uh, around the period of the Younger Dryas. So, you know, we were megafauna. We went through it. We survived it, uh, much as, as did any other species of megafauna that's alive today. But almost half of the megafauna at the time didn't. And, you know, it, it, was, it was a traumatic, just a traumatic event. And, you know, we lived through it, which I think makes it really interesting when you go back and look at what our, essentially our, our origin tales are. Across cultures, both modern and ancient, you can't 
poke a stick at any of them that don't include things, stories of things like, you know, catastrophic floods or world ending fires. I mean, these, these accounts of these types of things are embedded in our religions and in our cultures. They have characters and stories and gods written up all around them. But essentially, I, I think there's a chance that, that at the core of these things, they might actually be containing what could have been eyewitness accounts of some of the actual destruction that happened, either in the Younger Dryas or potentially periods before that. We know that that humans lived through this, that we would have witnessed it. Lots of humans would have likely died. And, I mean, how do you encode data and and, and remember events when you're talking about an oral history? I mean, at the time, you know, books or any form of writing, if it, if it even existed, wouldn't have survived. You pass these things down generation by generation as stories, as oral tales. And so, you know, they build up characters and stories around these things. But at their core, you know, we have this story of cataclysm that humans went through. And in, in many of these cases, uh, you know, even the, even in the, the, the modern day Christianity, the stories of the book, they talk about a civilization existing beforehand that was destroyed. Humanity was forced to start again. Uh, and this is represented across cultures. It's in the ancient Egyptian stories. It's in, you know, the, the Native American tribe, tribal stories. It's in South American histories. It's in Nordic religions. It's in, you know, Inuit stories. It, 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 it's in the, the, the Mahabharata and, and Hindu traditions. It's, it comes from all around the world because this, you know, these cataclysms and things like the Younger Dryas were a global effect. And for anyone that's interested, we could spend hours talking about individual things. I do have a video. This is the screenshot from the video. It's on my channel that kind of dives into some of these origin tales and what potentially they and the relationship they might have with the Younger Dryas Cataclysm itself. And now we come to what is the core topic for this presentation, which is the plethora of ancient advanced artifacts and technology that seem to come from some of the earliest times of known history. In this presentation, we're going to fo focus primarily on Egypt, as I said up front, but there are certainly lots of artifacts and stonework and things like that that we can look at from all around the world, but you know, we, we don't have unlimited time to, to go through all of this stuff. I do have videos that cover some of those uh, other places, South America, Baalbek, places like that. But particularly in Egypt, I think it's, it's the most well-preserved of our ancient civilizations, and it has some of the most just remarkable artifacts. And these, these artifacts come in sizes... Small and large, you can see here the, the schist disc, the unfinished obelisk, uh, precision-made boxes, vases, columns, and statues. And in a lot of cases, these things are coming from the very earliest times of known ancient civilization. And they represent technology that, you know, really is, is far beyond the capabilities of the tools that we know we used during those times in dynastic Egypt. And often when we're talking about vast periods of time, the question of, well, how come we're just looking at stonework? Uh, where are the tools? That, now, we could spend hours talking about where are the tools, but I think when you're talking about periods of vast an antiquity, you know, the stonework is really all that's left. That's what weathers time the best. Um, certainly anything metal uh, is, is extremely precious. Um, you know, gold and silver on its own, they're only decorative. They're essentially useless for, for tool use or weapon use. But any metal that is found throughout just thousands of years of known history would have been taken and would have been reused and it would have been melted down and reshaped to, to, to form some other purpose, regardless of, of what it was. Uh, not only that, lots of types of metals, you know, iron, copper, things like that can oxidize or rust and, and just, you know, over, in some cases, as 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 little as a century or two just turn to powder and, and aren't there. So primarily we're left with the stonework, but from the stonework and the tools and the precision of the stonework and analysis into their engineering, we can determine an awful lot about the tools that must have been used or what it must have taken to actually create these artifacts. Not only that, but we also have signs of some of the tools, and some of them seem to be extremely sophisticated. Uh, in fact, you can only really call it machining at some level. We have evidence for, for saw cuts, very advanced stone cutting, not only straight saws, but also circular saws. We've got evidence for advanced tube drilling um, and other mechanisms for removing 
pieces of stone. There is in the top left of this image, you see what looks like a, it's an unfinished surface on a bullnose that's on a box that's found at Elephantine Island that's quite clearly been machined in very straight lines before it was it was finished and rounded off to make it perfectly semicircular. It's an unfinished piece of work, which are actually quite valuable because they do leave tool marks that otherwise might have been polished out. And it's evidence for some very advanced tools and techniques that, that must have been used in order to make these marks. We can also determine the sophistication of some of these manufacturing systems through the geometry of objects themselves. Like center bottom here, you're looking at one of the cornice blocks that you can find on the Giza Plateau. That is just a tremendously complex compound curved surface that is just perfectly flat to the eyeball. And it would have taken extremely sophisticated manufacturing techniques to make this. We're going to explore some of these topics a little bit as we move forward in this, in this presentation. But it is worth remembering at the same time, how are these generally explained by the standard model, by Egyptologists and archaeologists? Well, they're explained with these sort of tools because these are the tools that we found. I talked a little bit about metal earlier. You could probably take all of the metal tools that have been discovered across all of ancient Egypt and they would fit into a very small room. It's incredibly rare and precious to find metal tools like this, but you can see they're very primitive. Uh, you have copper chisels and adzes. I think even so, like bottom left here, th these tools aren't weren't ever meant for, for stonework. These are more likely plaster tools or perhaps woodworking tools. We also have things like flint chisels. Uh, flint chisels were used uh, as, as a very hard substance to carve pieces of stone before people got around to figuring out iron and steel in later periods. Certainly flint's much harder than copper or bronze. And then the other tools were just pounding stones then that's pretty much it that's the the ancient egyptian toolbox right here uh, on a single page and the interesting thing is that the capabilities and the capacity to create stuff with these tools is is massively exceeded by the evidence that we have in stonework itself and in fact what i'm going to show you is that there exists across a lot of different categories of artifacts two different classes of objects some that represent the capabilities of tools like these and another class that really doesn't. Before we get into there, it's probably worth grounding ourselves just a little bit in terms of what we talk about when we get into Egyptian history or the, the orthodox history of the Egyptian civilization, also known as the dynastic Egyptian civilization. It's good to put some of this into context so that when we talk about Old Kingdom, New Kingdom, Ptolemaic times, we understand what dates we're talking about. And the Egyptian civilization itself kicked off earlier than 3000 BC, roughly 3150 BC, with Menes, who was the first pharaoh of the very first dynasty. He got started, that's something called the, the early period. Uh, this encompassed the first two dynasties. Then we, we went into the Old Kingdom, which is the, the period associated with just the mega pyramid builders, massive sites like Saqqara and Giza, the Great Pyramid, the Middle Pyramid. All of this happened in the Old Kingdom. There was just some remarkable pieces of work that are attributed to the Old Kingdom. In between these periods, there was something known as an intermediate period, which basically means there was civil strife, for want of a better term, in, inside of Egypt. The upper and lower kingdoms were potentially disconnected. There might have been different rulers before the land was again reunited into the Middle Kingdom, which was dynasties 11 through 14, another intermediate period. Then the New Kingdom. Uh, this is made famous by pharaohs such as Ramses, Ramses the Great, um, Seti the First, Ramses' son, Meren Ptah. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about them later on. Another longer intermediate period, then a late period. And then the Ptolemaic period, which was essentially the Greek-Roman period of ancient Egypt. And in fact, the, the dynastic civilization, as we know it, came to an end when uh, Cleopatra the Seventh committed suicide. Yes, it's that Cleopatra. There were a number of other Cleopatras before her, but Cleopatra the Seventh quite famously committed suicide, and that happened around 30 BCE. Now, the interesting thing to compare here is to note that, you know, this civilization stretched for more than 3,100 years. And so when you, you hear people say that, you know, Cleopatra is closer to us today in time than she is to when they say the pyramids were built, that's absolutely true. There's much more time in her past to get to, you know, the the the... the proposed date of building of the Great Pyramids at Giza than there is for her to get to, to our modern time. So this, this civilization was vast and it stretched more than 3,000 years. And it's an interesting comparison to make 
when you compare it to our civilization. If we're generous and say, let's say our civilization, if you stay, well, it started year zero. That's roughly 2,000 years. I think it's more likely, you know, 1,500 or 1,000 years to kind of get to to what we will call our civilization. And there's a clear technological process and, and evolution along that time, right? We, we were much more primitive a thousand years ago than we are today. Technology progresses in a, you know, an upward direction the longer a civilization goes. That's certainly been the result and the observation you can make by looking at modern history and at our civilization. What's interesting about Egypt and when we get into these examples is that really doesn't seem to be the case. The pyramids alone, these were some of the Great Pyramid, the, you know, the, the Middle Pyramid, the Bent Pyramid, the Red Pyramid. These were amongst, supposedly, the very first pyramids ever built. And it happened right at the beginning of the Old Kingdom. And we'll see many examples of some extremely sophisticated artifacts that were supposedly from the very earliest periods of time that never saw their match throughout the entire rest of the Egyptian civilization. It's a massive contradiction in terms of technological evolution and a technological time timeline. So just keep that in mind as, as we progress through and take a look at some of these different aspects of, of artifacts. So it's important to kind of ground ourselves and talk a little bit about how we actually relate artifacts and the things we're looking at into that standard model of history that we just went through. This really started to pick up steam and our picture of ancient Egypt was built out with the discovery and essentially the decipherment of something called the Rosetta Stone. And many of you have probably heard of the Rosetta Stone. It was found a long time ago. It's it's a Ptolemaic era plinth or stele that actually has a decree written on it in three different languages. It's ancient Egyptian in hieroglyphs, it's in Demotic, and it's also in ancient Greek. And this was really key to unlocking the study of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. The stone's been on display in the British Museum I think since around 1802. And it was Jean-Francis Champignon who really did the first transliteration of these Egyptian scripts and announced that, uh, I think, in 1822. And from there, the study of Egyptian hieroglyphs was born. And we could start to understand the things that were written on walls, that were written on artifacts. Along with that, we also have several different records of what you would call a king's list, which is a list of the rulers and essentially the length of their reign. And we can correlate those back to actual dates. Uh, and so we have this chronology of dynasties of different rulers of ancient Egypt. And remember that the ancient Egyptian civilization was was long and it actually ran into times where you can actually start to cross reference history from other civilizations. So the Greeks and the Romans, if, for example, could also record the names and the titles of pharaohs and rulers of ancient Egypt that you could then you could then cross reference with these kings list and so you start to get a good picture of time and how far back it goes and this essentially gives us this timeline of ancient Egypt and with that timeline and with the study of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs it's really the writing that becomes the bedrock of Egyptology this is it's not the only way but this is f by far the primary way of dating objects sites and everything else into that story of that timeline of, of ancient Egypt. It's the writing. If something has writing on it and it's got the name of somebody on it, then we can say, you know, this person had it made. Maybe he made the object. Maybe he made the entire site. That is the primary method for how stuff is dated uh, into that standard model of history. Now, this is an interesting concept because there are some issues with it. And to explore some of those, we need to get into, I think, one of the best examples for it, which is at a site called the Serapium which is just a, an incredible site. I've, I've made many videos on the Serapium and I intend to, to make a couple more. But it's a underground labyrinth, a series of these vast passages and alcoves and chambers that contain, you know, 24 or 25 of these just tremendous precision carved granite boxes or very hard stone boxes, granite diorite, cyanite. And some of these weigh with their lids up to around 100 tons. They're carved from a single piece of stone. The vast majority of these boxes are completely blank there's nothing written on them but there are three boxes in the serapium that have some hieroglyphs inscribed into them two of them it's it's only a one little passage or just one line but there's one box that is pretty much covered in glyphs and it, it's covered in inscriptions and this is that box here and you can see the nature of the glyphs that have been carved 
into this box. It's considered essentially to be the most valuable one because it has writing on it. It's the only one you're you're supposed to be able to go down and, and get in, you know, get close to and look at. And I love this image of it because on the right hand side where we're looking at the corner, you can see how perfect the stonework is. It's actually reflecting the light that's coming from the corridor off the surface of the granite. This obviously isn't a natural property of granite. It takes a tremendous amount of work uh, to get granite to do things like this. These boxes have incredibly straight lines. The interiors of many of them are just absolutely perfect, 90 degrees and, and flat as a mirror uh, on some of them. And it's, it's very sophisticated stonework, yet compare it to the quality of the writing that we see on the box itself. Here's a close-up of some of it. You can quite clearly see this writing has been done by somebody hammering on this damn thing with a chisel. The lines aren't straight. In fact, there's this whole some of the, the inscriptions are just skipped over the surface of the granite where it's too smooth. And it's very obvious that this is the result of a hand tool. Somebody going to town on this thing with a flint or potentially a, a, an iron chisel and trying to mark it up. There's a massive technological delta between the manufacturing of the artifact itself, the box, and the technology involved in the writing. Uh, I do hear some people often say, well, you know, it was probably different people that did the writing versus those who made the box. That's not really true. Stone carvers are stone carvers. It doesn't matter how good of a painter you are or a, you know, somebody who can do calligraphy. Try and do that into stone. Those skills don't really translate. Now, if you were to, if you were actually doing the writing on this box at the same time the box was being made, you would have the calligrapher, the 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 scribe, come and draw or paint the the glyphs and the lines on on the box, and then you would have a stone carver come and actually carve those into the stone itself. And it would, you know, it's the same set of skills that it takes to to work the stone and to create the object itself. And I don't know, I don't know about you, but if I was the guy who made this box and went to all the trouble and time and effort of getting all the lines straight, you know, perfectly straight lids and edges, and then polish this stone up to where it actually is reflecting light and somebody came along and wailed on it with a hammer and chisel like this, I'd probably be pretty upset. It, it does not seem to me to be contemporary with the nature of the box itself. Yet, it's the writing that's on this box that is used to date and relate not only the box, but the entire Serapium into that story uh, of, of the standard timeline of ancient Egyptian history. Also, we see here we can find on this box an empty Shen ring. This is on the front of the box. Uh, the Shen ring or the cartouche, which is used to, you know, just ex exclusively used for royalty and, and kings. There's no name in it. Now, if there was the name of a king in here, say it was Ptolemy I or something, if that name of Ptolemy I was in here, we could say that, oh, Ptolemy I, clearly, he's the guy who ordered this box to be made. He ordered the Serapium to be dug out of the ground. It was all done in his honor. And, you know, there goes the whole story of history. But this cartouche is empty. So what's going on here? Well, I think what's happened here is that we have to start to think about the concepts of, of inheritance and reuse. This site could be vastly ancient. The objects in it could be vastly ancient. And obviously, if it's discovered or found by dynastic Egyptians, it's quite likely that this site was taken over by, by priests who found it to be just as significant as we do. We go in, you're awe-inspired. You're like, man, look at these objects. We can't believe it. They could take over this site and essentially sell dedications on these boxes. They probably did the writing. They were probably waiting for the highest bidder to come along and want to have his name inscribed in here. We, we know this actually happened because in the entrance to the Serapium, all over the walls, you can find these little indentations on the walls where there were very small limestone or granite steles placed in there that you could pay the priesthood to, to have your name or your whatever this dedication is put into the Serapium. Uh, all of those steles are gone now. They were quarried in later times, but we know they were there. And I think this is exactly the same thing that's occurring here. The point to really take home from this, though, is that there's just a massive technological gap between the writing and the object itself. And it's not just on the boxes of the Serapium. We can also see it on many other artifacts, particularly those found in the Egyptian Museum. This is a Hyksos Sphinx. Uh, take a look at the very fine details that are shown here by the photography. The ribs are essentially using light to show their detail. 
Uh, it's an incredible uh, carving. It's a statue. It's made from, I think, looks like granodiorite to me, a very hard form of stone. But when you take a close look at the, the glyphs themselves, they are also very crudely chiseled in. Right, the, the lines aren't straight. You can see the marks that come from the hand hammering of, of chisels. It's dug in a little deeply, but they're done quite crudely. More details on statues. This is, a, this is an Old Kingdom statue. Again, something that comes from the very earliest times of the ancient Egyptian civilization. And it's incredibly fine. It's, it's a, made from diorite, even harder than granite. And you can see the, the upper thorax, the, the actual the, the top of the rib cage here is shown up in the very fine details. It's polished. It's just a beautiful piece of work. They were clearly able to polish uneven surfaces. Look at the, the thumbnails, uh, the actual the fingers and cuticles, even though there's dust on this statue, all of these different aspects of the statue are polished. This shows you that the creators of the statue were able to polish you know, non-flat surfaces. You have to remember that the, the standard model explanation for how stone was polished was that they used, they used rocks and sand and water. They would mix it together and rub rocks on it to, to polish it, which you can actually does, it mean that sort of technique might work on a flat surface, but it becomes very difficult to achieve once you're talking about, you know, curved surfaces or very fine detailed surfaces like cuticles or fingernails. But we, we obviously can see that this polish was able to be achieved by the creators of the statue. Another example, one of the best knees you'll ever see in sculpture, again, an Old Kingdom statue made from you know, granite diorite or, or, or diorite itself. The bone structure, the musculature, all of this just pops out of this statue. It's, it's incredible work. And again, we see that the, the stone is polished to a very high degree. Yet the glyphs don't show those same characteristics of technology that we see on the objects themselves. This statue, again, it's that one of those Old Kingdom statues we were looking at. It's an impressive statue. The glyphs are actually pretty well done. But if you look closely, you see the chiseling marks. You see that the lines of the cartouche aren't straight. You can see that the interior of the glyphs aren't polished. The interior of the bird, for example, you can see that's not polished. And this is something, once you see this on ancient Egyptian artifacts, you see it everywhere. You notice that the glyphs, you can, if you look closely, you'll see chisel marks, were clearly the result of hand tools. And you'll see that the inside surfaces of the glyphs are not polished. Compare that to the lotus flower motif that's below it. You can see just below this line of glyphs, there's a like a lotus flower motif that's on the side uh, of the artifact. That is polished. So they clearly had the ability to polish out these types of surfaces. They could have polished these glyphs out, but it didn't happen. So what does this mean? We, we, the glyphs... Of, uh, uh, massively inferior from a technological perspective to the statues and they're not polished is it possible that these glyphs were added much later and in a much more primitive fashion here's another example a beautiful old kingdom statue you can see it on the left here and then here's a close-up of the glyph that's just been roughly hacked into its chest on the right I think it's quite possible that we're talking about two separate timelines remember that it's the writing that we find on these artifacts that dates and relates them into the story of history and these are still old kingdom artifacts that the writing on them came from the old kingdom but the artifacts themselves have a, a massively different sophistication level in terms of technology and what it takes to create them not only that but these statues again these old kingdom statues this is a diorite statue uh, from the old kingdom also show, show signs of pretty sophisticated manufacturing in terms of overcuts uh, the, the, you can find overcuts on these statues along the seat, under the arms. And you have to remember that, you know, again, the standard model explanation for how stone was cut, it's grinding. So you get, you're using sand or you're using an abrasive material and you're rubbing on it with a copper bar or you're rubbing on it with a piece of horn or wood or something like that. And the rate of removing granite or removing diorite from that is is tiny. You would have to work for hours and hours and hours to make this sort of a mistake and have it show up like this. On the other hand, if you're using a much more powerful tool, something that removes stone much more quickly, think of something like a circular saw going into wood, it's quite easy to leave an overcut like this. And we see the evidence for overcuts on these statues. Here's some more examples. We can see overcuts under the arms of some of these statues. We can see the remnants of tube drills. Uh, between the feet of the statues, as well as overcuts on the inside of the legs. It's not only on statues that we can find things like overcuts. We see them uh, made into granite, into artifacts like obelisks, which you can see here. I think these are obelisks from Karnak. 
And these are very fine overcuts, most likely made with circular saws that have been made into just incredibly hard stone and they're still there for everyone to see today. And again, right next to, you know, hand hammered glyphs. It's an interesting fact that the evidence for, for power to, we're not going to talk too much about the techniques and sophistication of tube drills or circular saws. I do have videos that go into it and I do have presentations that, I'll, that, I've, that I've made on those topics, but we only see the evidence for these types of what you might term power tools on artifacts. We see it on, in boxes, we see it in statues, we see it in slabs, on columns, on obelisks. You don't ever see these marks in the writing. You don't ever see these marks on the writing, and or nor on the less sophisticated class of objects, which I'm going to get in and show you here. So to round out the, the talking about the writing and how we date and relate stuff into that story of history, this is one of my favorite pictures. It's from a site called Tanis, which is in the north of Egypt, up in the delta. And what you're looking at is a block that was originally an obelisk. So this, this block is actually showing you a number of different things. First of all, it's showing you the concept of renovation and reuse. This is a piece from a broken obelisk. Most obelisks you see uh, that are standing have the writing on them vertically, right? So that the glyphs are oriented in a, in a vertical line. This piece has been repurposed as a block in a wall, and it's clearly been written on in a horizontal fashion, right? You can see the glyph of Ramses II. You, you, once you go to Egypt, and you, particularly the, the New Kingdom sites, you'll see this glyph everywhere. It becomes very recognizable. This was... Ramses the second but if you look closely on the right hand side of this block you can get a sense for what was actually going on here Ramses was usurping this from an earlier installation or an earlier set of writing and in fact you can see how he had his his workmen and his stonemasons blend his writing over the top of a pre-existing inscription that was here before and he's actually written his name across the top of existing lettering that was probably put on that thing after the obelisk was repurposed as a block in the wall. So we don't know how many times this block has been inherited, renovated, reused, or even reinscribed. Now, Ramses is often thought of as being, you know, the greatest pharaoh of, of ancient Egypt or the most powerful ruler, and he's he's often termed that way in, in modern literature. Uh, Flinders Petrie called him the great usurper because the evidence of him usurping older artifacts and putting his name on them uh, exists all over the place in ancient Egypt, and it's not even disputed by mainstream Egyptology. In fact, some artifacts have as up to like five or six different pharaohs' names on them from different periods of time. How can we use the writing to determine when something was made? It just doesn't make any sense. Here's some more examples of you know features and writing that have been added later. This is at Luxor. This is a tremendous uh, temple that's uh, in in Upper Egypt. These huge single-piece granite statues are surrounded by sandstone pylons and columns. And if you look closely at the belt line of a couple of these statues, you'll notice something. There's obviously been a glyph inscribed onto the statue on the belt line and also just below that. But if you look closely, you'll see that that glyph has actually been added over the top of pre-existing features. There's a dagger or some sort of object tucked into this guy's belt here. And if you look in the top right-hand corner of the glyph, you'll see that the, the glyph's actually been inscribed over the top of the, the lines of that dagger. In fact, you can still see the line of the dagger there. Now, if you were making this statue with the intention of putting this glyph here, you would not go to the trouble of inscribing those features on the statue. You would design it in such a way that either the glyph was somewhere else or that the other the features were actually placed somewhere else so that you weren't you know, doubling up your work. This glyph was very clearly added at a later date. Uh, in fact, some of the statues here in, uh, in Luxor have the names of, of more than two pharaohs written on them, and they were added later. Yet those names are used to, to, to basically attribute these statues. That's why we call all of these statues, they're all supposedly of Ramses II, because Ramses II has his name on them. I'm not sure that means he's the one who had them built, but that's how it gets related into the standard model of history. Here's another example. You can see the size of a, this. This is a toppled over huge statue. You can see the neck piece and the you know the the crown edge, the shoulder and the chest of this statue. Quite clearly, this glyph has been inscribed over the top of the pre-existing features that were here on this statue. So we know the writing could have been added later on these things, right? We can't really depend on the writing to date and relate these artifacts into the story of history. 
What about other features on the statues? These are all Old Kingdom statues that you're seeing here. I'm going to show that this exists across multiple categories of artifacts. It's a tale of two industries. There is a very sophisticated category of these artifacts. These are some of the ones that are included. The Kafra enthroned in the center here is one of the most famous, most complete statues, Old Kingdom. Uh, again, it's named after Kafra because of some of the, the glyphs that have been crudely hammered onto it. But as we talked about before, these show just remarkable technology carved into very hard stone, just precise, perfect work, you know, polished surfaces, just beautiful work. This is a, a very sophisticated example of, of statue making. Many of these also show overcuts uh, and, and examples of, you know, very sophisticated tool use. Yet, if you go and you look at other statues and other examples, there's a whole other category of artifacts that come from ancient Egypt. All of those examples that I just showed you were from the Old Kingdom. Many of these examples came from the New Kingdom thousands of years later. You would think if you know you have that technological progression like we have in our civilization that these might have been as sophisticated if not more so but that's just not the case uh there are some beautiful pieces of work here like on the left here this is a young ramses ii being uh, protected by the god horun and the statue itself isn't polished you can see the hand hammering marks it actually reflects the same technology that's used to carve the glyphs that are written into it you can look at these other statues, you can quite clearly see they've been hand hammered. They're beautiful pieces of work. They're astonishing. I mean, these were obviously the results of, of very skilled craftsmen, but they were using primitive methods and they were using primitive tools. These statues match what we see in the archaeological record. The other ones do not. Some of these statues, when we get into some of the analysis, show a precision that really goes far beyond the capability of hand tools. Uh, I'd like to really acknowledge the work of Christopher Dunn in this area. In fact, these are screenshots from his book. I've had the pleasure of knowing Chris for several years now and consider him a friend. And he's really, I think, done some pioneering work in terms of analysis on some of these artifacts and showing that you really needed extremely sophisticated manufacturing systems in order to make them. One of the indications of, of precision is really symmetry. And if you look at the image on the left here, this is showing you the perfect symmetry of one of these giant heads that's supposedly of Ramses II that's found at Luxor. Uh, you can see that there's two Chris Dunns in this photo. He's sticking his hand on both sides of it. It's a reverse transparency overlay. What you do is you take a photo that's perfectly centered on the head, and then you make a copy of it, you flip it, on the vertical axis so it's like reversed and then you make both of those images 50 percent transparent and you overlay them that would then show you if there's any discrepancies at all between the left side and the right side and we just don't see it it's absolutely symmetrical it's perfect it's absolutely astonishing this this isn't a feature of any human face no human face is this perfectly symmetrical it's not a feature of you know great works of art like david carved out of marble by Michelangelo. It's 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 absolutely astonishing piece of work, but it doesn't show these aspects of precision. And one of those is symmetry. Um, this is absolutely remarkable and it's not achievable by using hand tools, particularly not on the scale we're talking about here. I mean, these uh, you're talking about 150, 200 to 300 ton statues, single piece statues uh, that are all made this way. And in fact, you can see that and by doing some basic photographic analysis of a number of these different statues by looking at the ratios between the eyes and the lips uh, across different statues that are found you know all around the world in different museums chris dunn also goes on to show that, that we see the use of very consistent curves um, the same the same radii the same circumference of different tools are used in different parts of the face this is indicative of the types of tools that are used and not only that, the faces are very, very complex geometric uh, objects. Perhaps it's it's a little easier to understand when you talk about the crowns that are on uh, some of these statues. They're, they're either a, a headjet or a pashent. These are like the, the bowling ball shaped crowns that sit on top of um, some of these statues. This again is a reverse transparency overlay set up on its center line, looking at one of these headjets. These things are absolutely remarkable. There, there's a couple of them that you can actually put your hands on at Luxor. Incredibly smooth. Now, there's no straight lines in any of these things. You, you're talking about a, a compound curved surface that, make, that is made up of, of curvatures of, you know, 
uh, flowing num flowing degrees. Like it, in some cases, they with the the top of the bowling ball or the the bowling pin, you know, those curves reverse on themselves, and they're perfectly symmetrical. This is a an extremely complex geometric shape to try and machine out of stone, and to, to suggest that anybody could create something as perfect as this to achieve this level of symmetry by hand is is frankly r ridiculous and you know engineers and machinists and people that work in stone know this and you know chris dunn commented on it when he wrote about these in his books quoting chris dunn the design and precise geometry that was crafted into ramses's crown is a symbol of a society that was disciplined in precision engineering and craft the pieces could not have been created without the aid of some kind of mechanical device that guided the tool along a prescribed contour Neither was this mechanical device a simple machine. Applying the tools of 50 years ago to the Ramsey's challenge would severely tax craftsmen skilled in manufacturing, and the tools and instruments necessary to ensure such precise geometry would not even be in a sculptor's toolbox. End quote. These things, many of them which come from the earliest periods of ancient Egypt, cannot have been made with the primitive tools that we know were used in that time this tale of two industries now this extends the contradiction the technological contradiction extends also to architecture let's consider the pyramids there are quite clearly two classes of pyramids that can be found in ancient egypt on the left we have the massively megalithic stone pyramids made up of huge blocks of stone and on the right we have the other pyramids that are all over egypt they're made from mud bricks and many of them are decaying slowly slowly over the years and they're starting to fall apart versus, you know, the stone pyramids are still standing and mostly intact. This presents a huge contradiction in the technological timeline because, as I mentioned, these massive megalithic stone pyramids are supposedly some of the very first pyramids ever built. This image is showing you we're looking down one of the faces of the middle pyramid and take a look at the size of some of the blocks in that first and second course of this pyramid. These blocks in the middle pyramid are far larger than those found even in the Great Pyramid. Some of them are probably around 100 tons, huge single pieces of limestone. This pyramid itself was also cased. The bottom layer or the bottom course or even two courses were cased in granite. And you can see the remnants of all the quarrying that happened to those granite casing stones from those bottom two courses scattered all over the place here. It's, it's a tremendous... I mean, you can talk for days about the pyramids... But this is a tremendous achievement wrought into stone. And yet it's, you know, these are supposedly the earliest pyramids ever built versus pyramids from later periods, the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom. They did continue to build pyramids. These are made with mud bricks. We know how they were made. They were often cased in limestone, but their structures were entirely made up of mud bricks. And in fact, the only scene on a wall in all of Egypt, it's a scene in the Tomb of the Nobles, that shows pyramid building was this technique. We show it, it shows workers making mud bricks and then stacking them up. And essentially, this is how these pyramids were built. Interesting idea, isn't it? When you when you look at all of these artifacts and you consider the idea that, well, could some of these things potentially be older than dynastic Egypt? Could potentially some of them have been inherited? Start to think about the idea of just, you know, um, replication of imitation. Uh, of, of seeing the grandeur and the wonder of sort of precise statues, vases, columns, even pyramids, you might want to imitate those. You might want to try and capture some of the significance of these objects or this architecture by doing it yourself, by trying to place yourself amongst the gods. We see this, we see this sort of iconography throughout the entire history of ancient Egypt, the way pharaohs put themselves in amongst the gods. Then we get into one of my favorite topics or classes of artifacts, and that is the vases. These are often, often uh, mistermed as pottery. They're not pottery. Uh, these vases are stone. They're made from just a remarkable and just diverse types, number of types of very hard stone. Schist, even corundum, porphyry, diorite, granite just a, a long list lapis lazuli all sorts of different types of extremely hard stone some of them like the one on the bottom right is a very high concentration of corundum in it corundums are nine on the most scale of hardness diamond being a 10 granite being you know a 6.5 diorite being a seven flint 7.5 copper a three three and a half iron a four or five steel a six so you know much harder than steel 
yet these vases and these plates and dishes were, were shaped from some of just the hardest stone pieces of stone and they show just absolutely remarkable uh, technological attributes some of them show just a perfect balance and symmetry this is one of my favorite uh, examples that's on display in the egyptian museum in cairo uh, it's as if this thing is standing almost on the tip of an egg i've got some close-up photos of the the bottom of this how it's is only a tiniest surface of this vase actually touching the ground but it's again symmetry is an aspect of precision and this thing is absolutely showing it it's just a remarkable uh, piece of work some of these are also just incredibly thin. It's, it, it shows a, a tremendous skill in manufacturing. This is a, a vase that is also in the Egyptian Museum, and you can see there's a large chunk that's been broken out of it on the right side, and a close-up image of it shows you just how thin that material is. This is incredibly difficult to achieve in stone like this. Uh, all of those, you know, those the white markings in the stone, they're crystal inclusions. Uh, of, often of a, a type of crystal like quartz or rock crystal that is much harder than the surrounding material, which makes it difficult to carve because you, you, you're going from hard to soft and also quite brittle once it gets to be quite thin. But you can see here they were achieving just a remarkable result in, in artifacts like this. And in fact, this is this is almost fat in compared to some of the examples that have been discovered over time. One of them discovered was discovered by the great... Flinders Petrie, who wrote about it in uh, the Pyramids and Temples of Giza in 1883. The example that he's writing about here isn't pictured here, but you can see some of the sophistication uh, of some of these hard stone artifacts. And what Petrie said was, quote, But the greatest triumph is a bowl of diorite, translucent and full of minute flaws, which must render it very brittle. Yet this bowl, six inches diameter, is only one fortieth of an inch thick over its greatest part. Just around the edge, it is thicker, in order to strengthen it, but a small chip broken out of the body of it shows its extraordinary thinness, no stouter than thin card. End quote. This is truly remarkable, and you can see a number of examples of this type of work. It is this is you've got to imagine this being hammered out or rubbed out, rubbed on with rocks, you know, stone chisels and rocks trying to achieve this sort of an end is it, it's frankly ridiculous. One of my other favorite things about these vases, and remember these vases come to us, they're generally pre-dynastic or very early period time, from a timeline perspective. You know, that's they're attributed to very early periods, if not pre-dynastic periods in ancient Egypt. And we'll, we'll get into some of the reasons why in a minute. But quite often in the displays, they're put next to other objects that were found in those same places and they're put into the same timeline because of that like they found them in a burial that is dated to you know pre-dynastic time or whatever the third dynasty or second dynasty and it, it's remarkable to me that you can say these things were made by the same people yet this is what you see and you can see many examples of this, of this type of thing in the Cairo museum they're displayed next to simple pottery actual pottery made from clay uh, you can see here you've got a essentially a precision carved very hard stone vase next to a pottery vase not only is are we looking at a pottery vase it's also one that's been made up to look like a granite vase this is clearly imitation work it, the paint's been dotted on it to make it look like it's granite it's formed it's it's hand formed from uh from clay and from pottery this was not turned on a wheel this is a hand formed vase you got to remember that too like there is no attribution of the wheel in uh, to the old kingdom period of Egypt, they 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 the standard model and Egyptologists do not attribute the old kingdom Egyptians with the use of the wheel. That includes things like the pottery wheel, the pulley, the chariot wheel. Everything was dragged around on sleds, and they used levers and ropes and you know human horsepower to make stuff. And quite clearly, the people who made this vase weren't using a pottery wheel either. Uh, the clay vase is is you know hand formed, and it's it's an imitation of these other vases yet because they it was all found in the same burial it's all attributed to the same period of time when you actually look into the manufacturing of, of these vases there's obvious evidence for the use of the wheel they were quite clearly turned now flinders petrie was really the first one to discover this and to start investigating it uh, his work was then followed on uh, by in modern times by chris dunn and others uh, this image is actually uh, some of the photos from Chris Dunn's book of him examining the very same pieces that Petrie wrote about in the Pyramids of Temples of Giza in 1883. And you can quite clearly see 
the rotational marks of lathe-like tools or turning tools. And again, no use of the wheel in the Old Kingdom, certainly not before it either. Uh, and what Petrie wrote about the manufacturing of these vases was, quote, the principle of rotating the tool was, for smaller objects, abandoned in favour of rotating the work. And the lathe appears to have been as familiar an instrument in the Fourth Dynasty as it is in modern workshops. The diorite bowls and vases of the Old Kingdom are frequently met with and show great technical skill. End quote. So again, we have a huge contradiction, both in terms of technology and in terms of the, the, what we look at and, and, and say the Old Kingdom could do. There's no evidence for the use of the wheel. There's no depictions of it. Yet here we're looking at artifacts that supposedly came from that time that were clearly manufactured by a sophisticated use of the wheel. These artifacts also stretch far back into time. As I said, pre-dynastic time. Here's a few examples. One of my other favorite objects uh, in the Egyptian Museum, which is a tube. It's a hollow tube of lapis lazuli with a gold sheath. This is a out-of-place artifact, if ever I've seen one. It's remarkably well made. I actually have photos looking up the end of it as well. Uh, it's quite thin. It's very symmetrical. It's a hard stone. It's been perfectly made. And it's in a display case next to bone and bead ornaments very primitive ornaments and artifacts around this thing and the sophistication of making this thing is is a worlds away from everything else it's displayed with yet it was found in a pre-dynastic burial along with these other artifacts did these people make it or did they inherit it did they find it we also see gourds essentially these these precision made stone gourds from single pieces of stone either obsidian or even rock crystal which is a very hard stone uh, again, all pre-dynastic. And when we talk about you know pre-dynastic vases and artifacts like that, they do stretch far back into time, even as many as almost 15,000 years ago. Uh, this was a, a site called Toshka. This was excavated on the what is now underwater as part of Lake Nasser when they put in um, the upper or the high dam in Egypt. This is now all underwater. This site was excavated in the 1960s. It's a quite primitive burial. You can see the guys in kind of a fetal position in the burial site but in that site they found not only primitive pottery handmade pottery but also precision carved stone vases made from very hard stone the exact same type that we see in other pre-dynastic burials and that are also attributed to the early dynastic period who was making these things and how did they get into these burials they're very sophisticated objects the vast majority of them however of, of all of these vases were discovered beneath the step pyramid of Djosa at Saqqara, uh, which is a third dynasty structure. Djosa was one of the latter pharaohs of the third dynasty. And beneath it, in all of the catacombs and chambers, there was more than 40,000 of these vases found. I've, I've had the chance, luckily, to visit down beneath the step pyramid. It's a regular destination uh, on our tours of Egypt. Uh, it's an amazing visit to go down there. There are There's more than six miles of tunnels that extend into the bedrock beneath the Steppe Pyramid. And there are actually fragments of these vases still laying around. You can see one, one pictured here on the right, uh, as well as an image from Jean-Philippe Loyer's original excavation of this site in 1936, where you can see just a huge amount of both broken and intact hard stone vases. There was, you know, more than 40,000 of them found down there. Some of these are inscribed. And once again, you'll note that the inscription is quite primitive. It's clearly been scratched into the very hard stone surface with probably a flint chisel or something like that. And some of these inscriptions provide a bit of an issue because they don't all say Joza on them. Many of them show the names of, of rulers that existed in the early period, the first or second dynasty. Uh, not all of them, but some of them do. And this sort of causes a little bit of a problem for the mainstream Egypt, Egypt, Egyptology story in terms of, well, how come how come he has them? Uh, and why were they found beneath Joseph's pyramid if he didn't have them made? Well, they do try and explain this, and I think they get the concept halfway right. And this is what you find if you visit the Saqqara Museum, although it, it's been closed for about a year or two now for renovations. But when I went there, there's a big wall display, and this is what it said uh, about these stone vessels. The production of stone vessels before Imhotep. The art of carving stone vessels, which were luxury items intended to hold mainly cosmetic materials and ointments, reached its peak during the first two dynasties. All of the types of stone found in Egypt were used. 
Now, Imhotep might be a name that's familiar. He was the architect or vizier or a, a guy that worked for Pharaoh Djoser. He's accredited with essentially designing the Step Pyramid. I think that's entirely true. He was a polymath, a genius. Uh, he was worshipped throughout the Egyptian civilization. Uh, and I think he was a guy that came up with a method for replicating these stone vases. And I'll, we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But they're telling you here that, well, you know what happened the first two dynasties? It, clearly, that's when you know some of these vases were found. They, they kind of ignore the fact that many of these vases come from pre-dynastic burials you know for thousands of years before the egyptian civilization they just say well you know the first two dynasties they could use all the types of stone in egypt to make the vases never mind that there's almost there's no evidence in any of the other stonework that is legitimately from those periods like first or second dynasty burials there's no evidence that they were able to to, to shape stone as precisely as as obviously whoever made these vases could but because you've got the names of a few of these rulers scratched onto them, and you know, Joes are obviously raided these tombs to get them, then that's uh, that's where they must have all come from. So they do actually they do actually acknowledge here one of the most important principles I think that it takes to really understand what's going on, and that is of inheritance. So stone vessels from the early dynastic period. More than forty thousand vases carved from hard stone were discovered in the galleries beneath the step pyramid. Many of these were heirlooms, dating from dynasties 1 and 2, and it is thought that Djoza had them buried under his pyramid after they were recovered from earlier tombs. End quote. I think Djoza gets this... Well, he, he's doing the exact same thing that I think had been happening in the past. He was just a powerful ruler who decided he wanted to get all of them, and he probably sent out everybody to, to raid as many tombs as he could, and he collected up like 40,000 of them. But this concept of heirlooms and inheritance is actually acknowledged here. I just don't think they're going back far enough. Were these things canopic jars? Well, certainly sometimes they might have been used as canopic jars to hold the organs as part of that ritualistic mummification of ancient Egyptians. Funnily enough, though, uh, displayed in the museum right next to these vases are the lids for the canopic jars. And you can see them here. They're very crude mud lids that have now formed into a hard plaster. I'd figure if you could make, you know, the vase from this hard type of stone, you could certainly make a lid. But these are the lids that we were found on sealed jars. So what is the standard model explanation for this? Well, that is also found at Saqqara. And it's a scene on the wall. It's, in fact, this very scene that's in the Saqqara Museum. Uh, there are replications of it, but this, I think, is the actual scene. And what you can see here is, well, they've got these, you know, weights are tied to, tied to, to curved sticks uh, those sticks might have a flint point and they're rotated around to make the artifacts. You can see a guy rubbing on the inside of a big vase with his hand. Another one sort of polishing one of these larger vases on the outside. So does this explain how these vases were made? Not even remotely. There's been a few people attempt to make, you know, precision stone vases uh, using this method. The results are, are laughable, frankly. Although, you know, I don't want to discourage anyone from trying i think it's a worthy experiment but there's absolutely no way known you can make the sort of artifacts that we've seen with perfect symmetry or wall thicknesses you know of a of a of a of a corundum impregnated stone down to 1 40th of an inch and so and translucent such that it passes light through it using these methods it's you're not even going to ever get anywhere near it however what this method does show is the primitive industry of vase making the, the alabaster vases, the industry of vase making that emerged after Imhotep. Again, this was all found at Saqqara in the third dynasty. That scene on the wall was probably a technique developed by Imhotep or somebody like him in order to replicate and to imitate these hard stone vases. And we can see the results of that process in all of these museums, Saqqara Museum, Cairo Museum, I'm sure there's plenty of these in the, the new Grand Egyptian Museum. These are very fine alabaster vases. First thing you should know is alabaster, the stone, or also called white calcite, is very soft. It's like a three on the most scale of, of, of hardness. It's probably about the same as marble, maybe a little softer. Much easier to work than stones like diorite or granite or schist. And you can see the result of that type of tool. These are remarkable pieces of work. They're, they're beautiful artifacts that come to us from ancient times, but they're not symmetrical. They're not perfect. The walls aren't, you know, paper thin. They're, they're clearly the result of a handmade process. And we saw that handmade process here. 
this is what this scene is showing. It's showing the production of alabaster vessels. And in fact, if you visit like the West Bank uh, up in Luxor today, you can go to alabaster shops and they will show you this technique. They'll be using similar tools to this to, to make alabaster vessels even today. It does not explain the manufacture of the hardstone vessels. And what's interesting about the hardstone vessels, all of these crazy types of stone and, and these precise vases with symmetry and precision and balance and thinness, they pretty much all disappear after the Old Kingdom. Joseph, I think, found most of them, and he rounded them up and had them buried with him, but they pretty much disappear from the, from the Egyptian record after that. There are a few exceptions, of course. I was probably... You know, different kings that found some or raided some tombs to get some. And do you know why these vases are said to have come from later periods? Well, it's because they were inscribed. There was a, a rough inscription written on the vase that might have had the name of a pharaoh that came from a later period, and therefore he must have had that stone vase made. You can see how the whole picture, the whole puzzle of history and, and the, the story of the, the Egyptian timeline and how we relate artifacts into it is built on these assumptions of, you know, he who wrote on it must have made it. And it's it's a faulty assumption. And it turns the entire timeline and dating of these artifacts really into a house of cards. It certainly doesn't exclude the possibility that these things existed long before uh, the dynastic civilization ever arose and they were just inherited and found and somebody else made them. And we see this, we see this most effectively in the vases themselves. So in recent months, modern analysis of some of these vases is showing exactly just how sophisticated and incredible they truly are. And again, we're talking about these hard stone vases from pre-dynastic and early dynastic times. There was a privately owned pre-dynastic rose granite vase that you can see pictured here. Uh, it's quite small. In fact, um, here it is. Here it is. Uh, here's, this is a 3D printed version of this vase. It's uh, decidedly petite, like six, seven inches in height. That's how big it is. Uh, this is an accurate to size 3D print of this vase. And it was scanned using a process known as structured light scanning, which gives us a 3D image of the exterior of the vase and some of the interior down to about a thousandth of an inch accuracy, which um, if people don't know in terms of relativity, you're talking about a sheet of printer papers between six or seven thousandths of an inch thick. A human hair is between two and three thousandths of an inch thick. So we can scan this thing down to an accuracy of, you know, less than half the width of a human hair. So it gives us a very good model to, uh, to examine and investigate of this vase itself. Once you put it through this process, that point cloud model, uh, it was analyzed in a coordinate measurement system or a CMM system uh, by engineers and metrologists that, that work for a, a company that makes essentially parts for jet engines and aeros in the aerospace industry by the name of Alex Dunn and Nick Sierra. Alex Dunn is actually the son of Chris Dunn, who I'd mentioned earlier. And I've got to say, I'm very thankful for them, to them for reaching out to me with their work because I had I had no idea what it would turn into, and we've we've since this project has has kind of got a life of its own at this point. The results that they found from this analysis of this point cloud model of this model of the vase uh, was really the starting point for some truly astonishing discoveries about the sophistication of some of these artifacts. This vase is a pre-dynastic vase. It matches many of the vases um, that you will find from pre-dynastic burials. And, and other sites in the museums. I often get the question about, well, how, how do we know it's pre-dynastic and what do we know about the provenance of this vase? Most of the vases, I'd say this, the, the vases that you find in, in, in museums, they have impeccable provenance and that's why they're in museums. The stuff that gets out to the private market, whether it's legitimate in terms of how it gets to the, to the private market, a lot of these things were given as gifts to, you know, uh, consuls and government ministers and people that have been involved in the in the governance of Egypt over the last several hundred years, uh, many of them were given as gifts to people like that. Many of them were probably taken from sites by you know foreign expeditions, and they, they eventually find their way onto the antiquities market through estate sales and being handed down in generations and eventually being auctioned off. You can find uh, artifacts like these on the antiquities market. They're quite expensive. Uh, and thanks to the, the few people who, who do have the means to collect them and, and are willing to let them be scanned and, uh, and analyzed. 
but this is absolutely a pre-dynastic granite vase and in fact uh, any discussion around its provenance is really moot uh, and I'll, sh I'll tell you why once we get towards the end of this section of it because this is by no means the only vase that we've investigated at this point. So by analysing the results from this scan we can start to put together the geometry of the vase and start to define some of the precision that we can find uh, in the vase itself and I'd like to explain kind of how that process works and why it's the results are, are really truly so astonishing. So, the vase itself is an ellipsoid, right? It, it's not an it's not a regular shape. It's not a geometric shape. It's not a sphere, a cone, you know, a, a, a cylinder. You you can't measure it and do geometry on the shape because it's irregular. It's an ellipsoid. So what you do is you is you take and you map regular geometric shapes to sections of the vase. And you do that by matching them using sort of thousands of reference points. So you you apply that shape to the surface, and then you you look at how many how precisely that surface matches the shape. And the more points that you use to to make that reference, the better. So in this case, we used you know in some cases tens of thousands of of reference points. So as an example, here on the the uh, the top of the vase, the vase lip, you can see in the image that we've applied basically a flat surface to it. We, we've matched it to a flat surface using 3,813 points of reference and it is flat to within 0 0.003. So that's three thousandths of an inch. So it's a remarkably flat surface, right? What this also does by creating essentially a flat surface on top of the vase, think of that as establishing a, a reference plane for everything else, right? You now have you now have a horizontal reference plane like an x-axis that lets you start to derive a, a, an XYZ coordinate system to measure other parts of the vase inside of a set set of axes and, and coordinate systems. Once you have that in place, this coordinate system, and you have the axes of the vase, so the top, the, you know, the, the horizontal axes of the vase, the vertical axes of the vase, you can then start to compare the parts of the, the other parts of the vase in relation to those axes, right? So how how flat or how perpendicular is is a part of the vase to the top? How how parallel is a part of the vase to the to the center line? Things like that. So that's that's really the 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 baseline for where you start with this. So you can see we we've named that surface reference surface A. So now we can compare other surfaces to that horizontal plane or that reference surface A. From there, we can look inside the vase mouth. So you can see here with the iconography uh, at the text at the bottom of the image, we've matched a cylinder to the vase mouth. So you imagine getting a cylinder in like a 3D program and, and, and blowing it up to where it fits inside the, the cylinder. And you can, you know, you could measure it with five points of accuracy, but in this case, we've used more than 10,000 different points where it perfectly matches, you know, the, the, the cylinder neck of the vase. And we can do a couple of things uh, with that. So you can measure the cylindricity of the of the cylinder itself, of the of the vase neck itself, uh, using, you know, more than ten thousand points of reference, and you see that's within thirteen thousandths of an inch of being basically a perfect cylinder, which is incredibly accurate. You're talking about, you know, a couple of sheets of, of printer paper in an area that's also quite damaged. You can actually see the damage on the vase here and the vase neck. So uh, that's just a measurement of the cylindricity of the vase neck itself. What's even more interesting is now that you've got a cylinder matched to the neck of the vase, the cylinder gives you a vertical axis. So you can compare the perpendicularity of the axis of that cylinder to the flat surface that we defined by the top of the vase, so that control surface A. And this is where things start to get really remarkable with this artifact is because we found that, that the vase neck or the vase mouth is one thousandth of an inch away from being perfectly perpendicular with the top of the vase. Like it is, it's it's just incredibly well made. So it's it's almost you're basically looking at a perfect ninety degree angle. Like this is this is perfectly straight, almost perfectly straight in relationship to the top of the vase, the the flat surface on the top of the vase. So we're within one thousandth of an inch in terms of perpendicularity. We can now extend that concept. Now that we have our, our center line of the vase and we have the top surface of the vase, the center line you know, being surface B, 
we can now start to match other geometric shapes to other parts of the vase. And this, this gets really interesting. Uh, what we're doing here is essentially matching a sphere to this lower part of the vase body, as indicated by the blue stripe around the vase body. So again, imagine a sphere that, that balloons up and it matches this section of the vase. And in this case, we're using you know 77,728 points to do so. And what we can do is actually measure that center point of that sphere in relationship to that center line of the vase. And it's within 17 thousandths of an inch of being perfectly on that center line. And this is, this is actually the biggest number in this entire report, but it's also probably one of the most astonishing numbers for a couple of reasons. One is that you're talking about a, a shape that's at the lower half of the vase. Like you're a long way from that vase neck that, that defines that center line. And the other thing is is that it's it's telling you not only is that sphere almost perfectly aligned with that center line, it's also telling you that it's an almost perfectly spherical section of the vase. And as this was well explained by Nick Sierra in the videos that I had covering this, you could measure a you know a, a, a sphere with you know five points on top uh, or, or eighty thousand points around it, and you're going to end up with a similar set of geometry, but if that sphere is deformed in any way, like so if it's a little squishy on one side, it's not perfect, that's going to actually deform and, and shift that center point quite a bit. So not only is this well aligned with that center point, it's also almost perfectly spherical, which it means that it's the, the, the shape of this part of the vase is amazingly consistent. Like this, again, remember that this was thought to have been used, created, this vase would have been created by some dude banging on it with a rock. Or rubbing on it with sand. This is a, this is precise. The surface is precise relative to the rest of the surface in order to keep that sphere um, regular, and it's been created in such a way that it's really close to that center line, to a degree that is beyond you know something you can touch or feel. This is absolutely remarkable because it tells you a couple of things about the manufacturing process. It's almost perfectly symmetrical. It's very spherical. Uh, which keeps that center point of the sphere so close to that center line of the vase. So you, you get a couple of pieces of information by doing this. Uh, and we, we've actually, if you watch the video that goes into the, the, the measurements, we did make this same comparison to a number of different areas of the vase. Uh, for example, the vase bottom. In this case, we're matching a cone uh, to these sections of the vase bottom using nearly 60,000 points of reference. And with a cone, we can look at you know how perpendicular uh, is that center line of the cone relative to the top of the vase, the surface A, which is the you know the vase top? It's within five thousandths of an inch, which is just remarkable. And then the cone itself is also parallel to that center line of the vase within nine thousandths of an inch. So this is again precision that's truly beyond touch and sight of a of a normal human being. You're talking about like a couple of human hairs. Or, or in, in one of these cases, maybe one human hair uh, off being utterly perfect. This is truly remarkable. And again, this is a portion of the vase that is the entire other end of the of the object from the top of the vase. Um, it's really important to understand the what this relative geometry means and why it's so important and, and why it has all of these implications for how these things were manufactured. This is simply not possible to achieve with simple hand tools gets even more interesting when you start to consider the lug handles because you know even if even if you go well okay let's grant them the use of the wheel right which nobody does remember the standard egyptology uh, version here is there's no wheel in the old kingdom certainly not before it but let's say they did do that let's let's say we grant them the use of a lathe let's say this was made on a lathe you have a problem with, and it was spun this way right you have a problem with the lug handles, yeah? You can't make these lug handles on a lathe. The best thing you could do would be to leave a bull nose that runs the whole way around the vase where the lug handles are, and then you would come back with another tool and you would you would cut that area away. But let's look at the lug handles themselves first. It turns out that they're astonishingly accurate. Not only not only relative to the reference, the grid, the X and Y axis that we've already established, but they're they're amazingly accurate to each other. So we can take lug handle one here, which is the one on the left, we can see that it's the, the cylinder that we match to 
the lug handle using you know over 4,000 points of reference is parallel with the top of the vase within one thousandth of an inch. It's perpendicular with the center line of the vase to within three thousandths of an inch. And we can actually define that cylinder itself as another reference surface, right? So we now call this surface F and you can compare lug handle two to it. So again, we can look at, we can compare lug handle two to the top and the center line of the vase. But if we compare the cylinder of lug handle two in terms of parallelism, it's seven thousandths of an inch off basically being perfectly parallel with the other lug handle. That's absolutely remarkable. Like that's, you, particularly because these had to have been formed separately, right? This is, and 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 even if it was turned on a, on a lathe, you, you have to cut these out separately. And that's a, just a remarkable margin of error. Again, not achievable by hand tools. This leaves the question. So if this had, to, if you had to come back with a, a tool, another tool later on and remove this area in between the lug handles, how do you do that? What about the area of the vase body in between the lug handles? Well, we went and we uh, investigated that area as well. And there's no perceivable lack of precision. And this is truly remarkable, right? So once again, we've matched a cone to this area of the vase body in between the lug handles using nearly 20,000 points of reference. And we found that the center line of that cone relative to you know, the, the, the uh, center line of the vase itself is within five thousandths of an inch. Why is that so astonishing? Well, even in our best modern tools today, so assume this was made on a precision lathe. When you do a tool change, when you, you, you come back, you, you have to change the process or change the tool, relocate this thing, go back to a different tool to remove the area of the vase here in between the handles. It's like doing a tool and a process change. Even with our very best machines, that introduces errors. And in fact, it's accounted for in the manufacturing processes we use today to make precision parts, you know, jet engine parts, stuff like that. We just don't see that in this vase. We don't see that that margin of error that we would get if we tried to do this today using that process. A lathe and then changing a process to, to carve this away. We would have a higher degree of error than what we're seeing here. That's truly remarkable. And it leads you to a couple of different conclusions. It's either, well... Either they were able to handle positional tool change and, and you know loss of calibration better than we can today with our very best machines, or this was not made on a lathe and instead was made in a single pass. Now we're talking you know five axis mills, something that has five axis of freedom. So we'll talk a bit more about that. But the initial geometric analysis of this vase on its own is is was a tremendous discovery and, and it, it really shows you the sophistication of the manufacturing tools and system that was required to use this. But that's not where it stopped with this vase. In fact, that was really only where it got started because we go deeper down the rabbit hole with this. Uh, and I, I really want to thank um, the owner of the vase for allowing us to publicly release the STL file, the model. Uh, it's available for download on my website, unchartedx.com. You can go and get it today and play with it in Blender if you want to. But this resulted this essentially we open sourced this investigation now to interested people and there were there were several of them but in particular uh, there was a Danish cryptographer named Mark Kvist uh, he runs a website called unsigned.io and he undertook essentially a deep mathematical and geometric analysis of the vase and and really his findings here are, are nothing short of revolutionary that's why I wrote it um, uh, on the slide here I think it's utterly remarkable what he's discovered so what he did he started with looking at can we find a, a pattern of geometric shapes that sort of make up different features of the vase and what he found was that yes there was a couple of different grids of basically these these circle of life patterns this is this interlocked circular pattern that you see uh, you see it on lots of things it's it's on the Assyrian it's it's typically considered to be an element of, of sacred geometry uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about about what that means later but he found that that these circle of life grids match different features on the vase and this this looks complex but it's not too hard to understand if you follow me through it the blue grid here is uh is based on the maximum internal diameter so you see these two points d they show that they're matching the measured maximum internal diameter of the vase you can also see that this circle of life grid is used to determine both the top of the vase with the the blue circle at points a and also the center point width of the 
the the basically the the upper part of the vase with these points of B. So the internal diameter and the circle of life grid based off that matches other features of the vase. And then the red grid with the red circles matches the maximum external diameter of the vase here with point C. It's also used to, we can, we can use both of these circles and the way they interact to define the bottom of the vase. There's a lot that we started, that Mark started to discover once he started looking at the geometric relationship between uh, different parts of the vase. So he measured and mapped lots of features and he found a lot of repeating patterns and mathematically significant ratios. Uh, not only that, but but these ratios and these patterns had, had complex interrelationships between them that were using different mathematical principles. So this started to lead him down the path of like, well, perhaps this vase was actually mathematically designed. This object was clearly designed. Like these these interrelationships and these ratios and these uh, these geometric features weren't here by accident. Like it's not an accident that he found them. It seems pretty clear that these features were designed. And then that design was executed with astonishing precision by some sort of manufacturing system, right? We've just finished talking about how precisely this vase has been made. Uh, and in fact, you know, Mark also did some analysis along that. But the key takeaway here is that this vase wasn't just made by some guy, you know, eyeballing it with some rock and sand and, and you know, pounding stones. This thing was designed. One of the interesting aspects of the vase is that uh, a fundamental principle of its design is something called the radian uh, and the use of the run one radian arc. Now, radians are pretty easy to understand if you don't know what they are. They're a method of measuring angles. Uh, it's actually a more elegant solution than using the arbitrary kind of, you know, 360 degrees that we carve a circle up into. Uh, what you do is you take the radius of a circle you take the length of that radius, you apply it to the circumference of a circle, and the angle that it forms in the center is a one radian angle, right? So you can go all the way around in two radian angle, uh, you know, uh, what we would call a 180 degree um, uh, angle or a straight, you know, half of a circle is a pi, is pi radians. That's how many degrees are in that. And we know that there are two pi radians in a circle. So it's a, it's a geometric model of measuring um, angles in a circle. And interestingly enough, several aspects of the vase's geometry are actually derived by the use of the one radian angle, the one radian arc. And you can see a couple of those examples here. Uh, those points B from that circle on the left hand image, uh, actually the, the, um, the slope and the degree of slope that's in the vase is actually determined by the use of the one radian angle. Uh, also, the placement of the handles with that center point of that circle of life grid uh, is also determined by the use of the one radian angle. There are several other examples in Mark's article, which uh, I'm sourcing these images from. And this goes even further when we look at some of the mathematical aspects of the vase. The, the most widely used primitive geometric shape in the vase is the circle so there's lots of the use of circles here right it's 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 arcs of circles portions of circles uh, are pretty much used to define many features of the vase what mark found which is is tremendously interesting is that the radii of these circles of all of these circles that you can see here defining all of these different tiny little curvatures and other parts of the vase uh, other other angles and curves in the vase can all be ex they're they're all tightly interrelated. They can be expressed by the use of a single equation. It's called the radial traversal pattern, and he found it by reverse engineering the aspects of this vase. This is this is a, a huge finding because you can now start to understand how you might be able to express this entire vase in an algorithm. Right? This vase was designed, and not only that, it was elegantly designed. This level of complex interrelationships between these radii that can be expressed in a single algorithm is not an accident. And if you had circles that were of a different radius, they wouldn't fit this pattern. Like It's not just any circle that fit this pattern. There is a specific size of circle that actually fits this pattern, and it's those circles that we see making up, or the, the angles and radii of them, that we see making up the curvature of the vases itself. So he thought, okay, let's let's try something. Let's create a CAD model of the vase that's based purely on the radial traversal pattern. 
right? So let's let's actually just create a model based on the mathematics that are re that he's reverse engineered. He did that. And the the size of some of these circles, you can see them here. There's there's 12 or 14 of them. Uh, the radii of those circles range from 42 millimeters at the top end right down to 1.1 millimeter at the low end. That's that's you know a 25th of an inch. That's that's a that's a tiny circle with a radius of one millimeter. But all of these circles fit the radial traversal pattern. So he created a model just based on that one algorithm, and then he compared the actual model of the vase to the CAD model, and this is absolutely amazing he found that the median radial deviation from that CAD model was nine micrometers that's less than a thousandth of an inch so 0.35 of a thousandth of an inch it's that's just astonishing the purely mathematical design is is perfectly represented essentially within under a thousandth of an inch by the 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 vase the model of the vase itself so this thing was designed using mathematics and it was executed uh, with an extremely precise manufacturing system it's really it's it's an unfathomable unfathomable achievement it's it's completely consistent microscopic precision that's implemented across 12 different radii with complex levels of interrelationships it's all done in granite I mean this is this would be extremely difficult to execute and, and achieve today to this degree of precision and the sophistication of design that seems to have gone into this thing. So, so it's not only a radial traversal pattern. The vase also encompasses and 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 shows other, um, I guess you would call sacred geometry encoded into it. Uh, both pi and the golden ratio are encoded into the vase in several locations. You can see here with the the inner diameter of the vase from the top down view, or the the, the vase neck to the outer diameter of the um, the vase top equals pi to within 0 0.01 of a percent and then also the golden ratio is exhibited in a couple of places actually but at the top of the vase here it's shown that the uh, the golden ratio squared is also shown up here within it with an accuracy of less than 0 0.1 percent now we're talking about sacred geometry and and the golden ratio is not just some crystal hippie sort of woo-woo thing that's it's a very significant ratio that's that's actually defines how our universe is structured it's an indication of knowledge when we look at the vase itself we we have to now consider like okay how do you go from design to manufacture right we know that from the precision the complexity the depth of interrelationship of the different circles and between the different vase features really rules out uh, random chance uh, as Mark put it in his article, I, I love this quote, he said, it'd be far more likely for you to wake up one morning and have an entirely new quantum universe sprouting out of your left nostril than it would be for this thing to have purely had all these features put into it by random chance. This artifact was undeniably designed. Could you design it on paper? Is there an analog mechanism for designing this on paper? Well, you might be able to design it on paper if the, you know, the piece of paper was like the size of the room you're probably sitting in. Um, but you try and draw a circle with a radius of one millimeter and see how you go. We, we just have no ability to actually draft and draw out some of the microscopic features of this vase on paper at, at, at you know, a one-to-one -one scale. You can't do it. Even if you designed it on, uh, on paper at a large scale, you still have to scale it back down and somehow execute that in granite. So turns out the artifact is is best represented mathematically we can we can define the vase with an equation or a series of equations this design this mathematical design was then somehow transferred to a manufacturing system and then executed in rose granite no less with just astonishing precision and as we discussed earlier with the area between the vase handles there was no perceivable loss in positional calibration or precision across you know, all of these different curves, nor the area of the vase body in between the handles. So, you know, as I said before, either this was machined in a single pass, like on one system, uh, or, you know, they had a method that could handle, you know, loss of positional calibration with tool changes better than we could. This is, you know, a remarkable set of conclusions that we can come to that are, that are backed by fact and analysis of the vase itself. So... How do we go from math to real-world output? And this is where the evidence and the logic leads. And I'd like to quote Mark himself uh, in this 
in this portion because when I, I had to read his article several times to, to really get it, but I think he makes a very strong point here. Quoting Mark Kvist from unsigned.io, quote, As far as we know, no human beings, trained animals, or naturally occurring phenomena, modern or ancient, take mathematical formulae and equations as input and produce lathe operating motions as outputs. For all of the knowledge and insights we have accumulated over the ages, we know of exactly one and only one category of things capable of such behavior. The kind of thing that we refer to as a Turing machine, a device capable of taking input, holding state, performing operations on held states according to predetermined principles and producing output. Now, you can make Turing machines pneumatically, mechanically, hydraulically. We make them a lot electronically. We call, this class of, we call this class of device a computer and no plausible way of representing, operating on, or manufacturing the design of this artifact exists without having access to one such. This thing had to have been designed on a computer, some form of Turing machine. We, you know, a sophisticated one too, like not a very simple mechanical Turing machine, but something that was is capable of taking a sophisticated design like this represented mathematically and then producing an output to some sort of manufacturing system uh you know the lathe operations or, or mill operations um the 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 manufacturing system itself also had to be incredibly precise and sophisticated so are we looking at the result of hand tools here of you know people rubbing on rocks with sand and water and other rocks i don't think so so what can we conclude from this I think this artifact is much more than just a simple vase, right? It's it, it represents far more with that. We know that it's elegantly designed with an elegant system of mathematics that seems to be even based on geometric principles like the radian. In fact, the, the basis for the whole mathematical system might have been a base radian or a base pi system rather than our own base 10. Uh, it's an elegant system of mathematics. And more than that, encoded within it are the principles of sacred geometry, which turns out is the very fabric of our universe. The golden ratio isn't just a, a random number. It's expressed in nature from the very smallest of, of particles to the very largest structures in the universe. Uh, the double, sp double helix of DNA itself shows the golden ratio. If you take a section of, uh, of DNA, you cut, it, you cut it in half and you look down on that top-down view, that shows... The golden ratio it's expressed in life in terms of plant growth the structure of the human body uh it's in the shell growth everybody's seen the famous golden ratio fibonacci series of of, of shells growth uh it's reflected in the movement of hurricanes and cyclones even up to galaxies the movement and the motions of galaxies reflect this the the, the golden ratio and some people some scientists have even theorized that the structure of space-time itself might reflect the golden ratio it's a constant in our universe and the fact that it's represented along with these other elegant geometric principles things like pi long before they were ever supposedly discovered is indicative of the knowledge set that is 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 being shown to us by the creators of this artifact the whole vase tells the tales of the their of its creators capabilities their elegance their knowledge set uh, and as i said before even their mathematical system and potentially the way that they viewed reality now, this was really interesting. Once once this research came out, it's a, a story I like to tell. Uh, Nick Sierra, who's one of the, the you know, metrologists and engineers, he has a couple of degrees in engineering, deeply involved in the aerospace industry. I mean, he, he did all of that initial geometric analysis on the vase. But once Mark's analysis came out and he showed the, the actual true depth of mathematical interrelationships between this and, and the... And, and, showed that it was encoding some of these fundamental principles of the universe he he had he called me up he's like i have to talk to you he said this thing is it's keeping me up at night like his worldview had just been fundamentally shaken by by this by the results of this analysis like he could sort of understand i think it didn't shake him too much to look at okay there was some precise manufacturing going on but the fact that this data is encoded in this vase and this thing is you know at least five thousand years old probably way older it, it, it finally shook his worldview to the point where he's like, I'm waking up at night like thinking about this because it's just blown my mind that this data is in there. And he related a story to me, which I thought was really apt and I like to put it in here, in that in some ways, this vase is very similar to the golden disks that are on the Voyager probes, 
right? We, we sent out these two Voyager probes in the 1970s. And on those probes are these golden records. And using geometry and radioactivity and a whole bunch of other techniques uh, that aren't just isn't like we're just writing on it, these, these, these disks are sent out into space and they encode information about our species, about our knowledge base, about where we are uh, in the universe. They tell a tale for people that can decipher them, that can decipher all the information that's encoded in it. And in a lot of ways, we're seeing the same thing from this vase. This vase is telling us about the capabilities of its creators, about their worldview, about their sophistication, about their mathematical system. And, you know, like the Voyager probes being sent out into space, it, it seems like this vase and artifacts like it have been sent through time. Uh, so it's, I thought that was a, a wonderful um, comparison between the two of them. And in a lot of ways, you know, we can see how this one object is much more than just a vase. So where do we go from here? Well, I think to start with that it's extremely unlikely that we've just hit a unicorn on the first try. This was the first vase that has been analyzed to this degree, uh, but clearly we need to expand our data set. And, and obviously the other thing that I'm tremendously um, grateful for is the benefits of basically crowdsourcing this research and putting this out to the public and getting analysis like that that we saw from Mark at unsigned.io. Uh, it's pr provided some just remarkable um, results. So several more vases are currently under under analysis. Um, they're being scanned. We're looking at even better scanning techniques than structured light. We're looking at using CT machines, which give us sort of micrometer precision. Also very accurate maps of the internal structures of this vase. You can see here, uh, this is actually a scan of this same vase from a CT machine that gives us really accurate an accurate look at the internal um, features of the vase. And we've also made some promising progress with museums because ultimately I'd love to see this research actually get us to a point where we can go in and scan and analyze some of the artifacts that are in museums that have just impeccable providence. But in the meantime, uh, we're working on some vases that have been come out to us from, from some amazing uh, private collectors. And this is why I said some, the provenance isn't an issue because some of these vases have just incredible providence as well. And they're, let me tell you, tremendously expensive. And some people have, have actually on the back of these videos actually gone out and purchased them. And here's some of these examples here, just a couple of videos looking at some of the vases that are being uh, analyzed. This is a, a granite rose granite vase that's so thin it's translucent. You can see the light coming through it. Uh, here's another vase that also shows just an amazing degree of uh, symmetry and balance that just spins perfectly on its tip like that. So we're looking at a whole host of different vases that are being scanned. And I can tell you that some of the results that I've seen coming back from the geometric analysis of them, it's even more astonishing than the original vase that we scanned. So some of them are showing, like literally zeroing the meter in terms of thousands of an inch you know of precision like even more accurate like it's 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 not a it's not a random one-off occurrence let's just put it that way so uh look forward to much more analysis um coming up on these vases but i think we're just we've really we're really only looking at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this research all right we're kind of in the home stretch of this now because remember we started this talking about the tale of two industries and the primitive and sophisticated versions. We looked at statues, we looked at the vases, we looked at the pyramids. This tale of two industries extends to other artifacts as well. And we're gonna briefly cover a couple of them here. This is one of my favorite uh, photos. This is out at uh, the Maidum pyramid. This is a, again, an old kingdom pyramid structure, but you can see here just even lying out in the sands, there is what appears to be a precision carved or very well made uh, granite box. It might be granite diorite. And just to the left of it kind of cut off from the image, you can see a very, primitive limestone coffer or a limestone box, undoubtedly a sarcophagus. Um, these, are, these are representative of two very different technological industries. And again, you can, you can see this when you go and you look closely at the boxes that you see across all of ancient Egypt. There is a class of boxes that is quite clearly handmade and even they're hammered out of granite. I, for some people think I dispute the dynastic Egyptians ability to work granite. I, I certainly don't. Uh, you can definitely work granite with other stones and with flint and with tools like that. And these boxes, there's, a, there's three granite ones here and a limestone one in the bottom left, absolutely the result of hand tools. Hand hammering, you can see it all over it. 
Uh, it's they're amazing pieces of work, but they're made by hand. On the other hand, there's another category of boxes. We talked briefly about it before in the Serapium, but there's also an amazingly precise group of boxes, ones that have um, you know flat lines, perfect geometry. You range, you see them in the Serapium at Lahoon, uh, beneath some of these go back to the oldest times in ancient Egypt. Uh, there's one here on the bottom right, which is in the Osiris shaft, which is you know 150 feet below ground uh, on the causeway at Giza. You also have these strange boxes like the one in the bottom left of uh, at, at Elephantine Island. I have a whole video looking at that box. In fact, I have a, a video about several of these boxes. This, ca- this class of boxes actually have just remarkable precision. Um, not all of them, but many of them show just astonishing precision. You can see on the, the image at the left here, I'm actually standing up on top of the lid of one of the boxes in the Serapium. I'm looking down into it. And you can just see that reflective surface and, and just sharp angles on the inside of these single piece, you know, granodiorite boxes. Uh, you'll also see an image from the inside of one of these boxes. This uh, is a box at the Serapium. Again, you can see these just perfect 90 degree angles uh, as measured by Chris Dunn, as well as Ahmed Adley. Several other engineers have measured different parts of these, of these boxes and shown that many of them are just these perfect 90 degree angles. Not only the interior surfaces, but also relative the lid, the geometry of the lids is just perfectly 90 degrees with the walls of the box. Um, there are some there are some people that have tried to disprove this uh, with some sort of sketchy methodology. I'll just say where they're showing things like the angles of outsides of the boxes, where it's quite clear they were never shooting for 90 degrees. They've got like you know tilted um, tilted angle finders and digital calibrate digital angle finders that haven't been calibrated or they're just you know going out of their way to find odd spots uh not all of these boxes are in fact finished uh in fact let me skip right to that um and we'll come back in a minute but not all of these boxes are actually finished some of them are still incomplete you can see here there's a a giant box in the serapium that's that's not polished it's not finished there's an inside corner on one of these boxes in the Serapium that isn't finished. And even the, the box in the hallway at the Serapium, clearly not finished. It's in quite a rough state uh, and it's been left in the hallway. That's me trying in vain to actually move the damn thing. Um, so yeah, there is, there, is a, there is a spectrum of levels of finishing on these boxes. I'm not even convinced that going for a perfect surface and 90 degree angles was what they were actually aiming for. That might have been the standard template that they would get if they could, but it might have been more important for them looking for things like wall thickness and sol- solidity of the box. This is a, a topic for a Serapium video that I'm actually working on now that's been based on a lot more research that we've done in recent visits to the Serapium. So hopefully that video will come out later this year. But you might think that, well, okay, so there's sophisticated boxes and there's primitive boxes so they must have started with the primitive boxes right and then got better at their craft going forward well again much like with the pyramid much much like with the vases even the statues that's not the case the most sophisticated boxes in many cases are the oldest and the more primitive ones are the newest Uh, the oldest known single piece box this is one from the third dynasty Uh, it's located at mastaba 17 it's on the my doom site this is a in a megalithic chamber beneath a huge mastaba Uh, it's thought to be this box might be the oldest at least according to the standard timeline and it is a 13 ton single piece precision carved granite box Um, so yeah again we're looking at this contradiction in the technological time frame some of these boxes have been analyzed to a certain degree i certainly think they're worthy of much deeper levels of, of scanning and analysis much like we've done for the vases but there's one box in particular that's been looked at uh, by Flinders Petrie as well as a couple of others, and it's this granite box that's located at Lahoon. It's in a granite room. It's the whole room is made up of of granite with a curved ceiling. The box itself has just a like a like a chamfered lid that runs around it that's quite unique. We, well, not lid, the top surface. There is no lid known for this box. There's not a single hieroglyph anywhere on it or in the room. We have no clue about how old it is, although it's beneath a pyramid that's attributed to, I think, a middle uh, kingdom pharaoh. And Flinders Petrie first discovered this when he excavated the site, and he measured the box and spent a fair bit of time with it. And what he wrote about it was quite astonishing. He wrote this in Elahun, Cahoon, and Garob in 1891, quote, 
The sarcophagus is perhaps the finest piece of mechanical work ever executed in such a hard and difficult material. The surface, though not polished, is smooth ground to an impalpable fineness and most exquisitely flat. For instance, along the top length of 106 inches, the errors from a straight line are an average of seven thousandths of an inch. On the ends, 50 inches long, the, average, the errors are an average of four thousandths of an inch. Lastly, after straightness, flatness, and parallelism, there is the question of ratio between the dimensions or accuracy of proportions. This is far more difficult, as it requires all the previous accuracies, and in addition a truly divided scale, and an irremediable truth of work, since nothing can be corrected by removing more material. End quote. I think this is a tremendously important paragraph, the second one that Petrie mentions, because what he's talking about is the relative geometry of the object. It's the exact same thing we were talking about with the vases, when we talk about how spherical the bottom of that vase is to the top surface and how parallel or perpendicular it is to our reference planes. That's exactly what Petrie is talking about here. And it's one of the most important, the most difficult aspects of these boxes. And it is almost always overlooked by people who claim that these can be made with simple hand tools. A lot of people will get some you know, lapping stones and they'll lap a surface flat and say, see, I can do it. Or they'll get a piece of granite and they'll chisel in like a, an inside corner on the outside of a piece of granite and go, see, we can make an inside corner. It's, you, it's ignoring the most difficult aspects of that project. And in many cases, those aspects are the relative geometry of the faces. How do you keep perfectly parallel surfaces that are 10 feet apart? How do you machine or, or create the, the bottom of a vase, the spherical nature of the bottom of a vase such that it's within five thousandths of, of an inch of being perfectly, you know, parallel with the, the center line of, of a vase? Like the, it's, it's a dishonest comparison. And, and people that dismiss or just ignore these aspects of these artifacts have no understanding of what it takes to actually manufacture them. Generally, it takes engineers and, you know, machinists and people that actually do the work and it's one of my main criticisms of, I guess, the archaeological field in general is that they're not engineers and they typically do not listen to engineers and, you know, craftsmen that actually understand what it takes to create these things. But this is a... Petrie knew it, you know, 150 years ago. He knew. And he, he understood... He was the first person to apply modern kind of engineering principles to these artifacts. And he knew the relative geometry of this box was mind-blowing. Like, it... You can read it in his words and, and from, you know, Victorian era kind of language, he, his mind was blown by this and he had no clue uh, how it happened and he wrote about it. So as I said, they're not all finished. And again, in many places, the unfinished work, we can see signs of advanced methods of construction. We're not going to go into any tremendous detail on this, but we can see the use of pretty advanced either straight or circular saws in the construction of these boxes. Uh, there's other signs of sophisticated uses of tube drills on the inside of this box. Uh, this is in particular is one that's found in the Cairo Museum. It's it's an unfinished box. You have to kind of find it and then ho go around behind it to see the really interesting parts of it. But it is there. Uh, even in the one of the oldest boxes known, this is the the so-called sarcophagus in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. If you can get enough light on it and see it in the right conditions, uh, you will notice the use of sophisticated methods of construction. Uh, very powerful saws were used to cut this granite and shape the granite. On the inside of the box, you can see the remnants from a tube drill that ran astray. A very powerful tool that, that ate into the wall of the box. It was a slight mistake, and you can see that the bottom right image here. That's actually on the inside uh, of the box itself. And there was also clearly tube drills used in the corners in order to create uh, the, the radius that we see in there. So these things were not made by pounding stones and copper chisels. This tale of two industries extends also to the columns. Uh, we've seen boxes, we've seen architecture, we're, you know, we've seen vases, also the columns. There exists a category of, of just single piece granite columns in ancient Egypt that is just truly remarkable, truly remarkable. The best example that I know of of a column end piece is at a place called Bastet. That's um, top right and bottom left here. And it's a just a incredibly well-preserved piece and you see the flared endpoint some people call it you know a lotus or palmed shaped column 
uh, with the bull nose that runs up along it. It's it's incredibly precise and and smooth to the touch. I don't know how this thing has um has lasted over so many years. You can also get a sense for how big these things were uh, with me in the image next to one that was at Tanis. They actually came um, in sizes much bigger than this, but at places like Tanis and Bastet, it's like they were stamped out in a factory. Uh, making this type of single piece granite artifact is incredibly difficult. If you take a look at the, the top column here that's horizontal, you can see the shape, right? It starts thick at the bottom, it gets narrow, it gets narrow, it gets narrow, and then it flares out at the top. And this is all one single piece. This is remarkable. Even the Romans, when they made columns, like the ones at, you know, at the at the the, the Pantheon in Rome, uh, you know, it's they're they're made in circles. They're they're quite rough. There's been some studies done on these, but they would put a different piece of stone on top because they didn't have the ability to, to flare out on top like this because your single piece of stone has to be wider than the widest part at the top and then you've got to actually somehow machine this entire piece out of that one block of stone and keep it perfect without without messing up and it's just incredible um, workmanship it's just yeah amazing to, to think how this might have been achieved and you know heavy too you're talking a couple hundred tons for some of these things uh, even more when you look at some of the other, like Pompey's Pillar uh, up in the north of Egypt, just a huge column. And what's more is these these exact columns, these palm-shaped flared columns, come to us not only from the old from the New Kingdom. Some of those columns are on New Kingdom sites, which we know the New Kingdom because Ramses wrote his name on them. But we know they also existed in the earliest times. We have these flared palm-shaped pillars. We can find them at Abu Sir and at Saqqara and at Giza and some of them are in the museum there's a two columns still standing that are at Abu Sir and these are all old kingdom sites so again we know this these types of columns these exact type of columns existed from the very earliest times in ancient Egypt and they reflect extremely sophisticated manufacturing in stone so what about later periods what happened in the new kingdom well this is what happened in the new kingdom there was a lot of what I think imitation going on you can see here like these tremendous temples i mean not taking anything away from their beauty and majesty and wonder but at karnak and at luxor these huge temples that were supposedly built by ramses the second they're they're soaring ceilings and massive columns but they're all made from sandstone and you can see exactly here uh, i think this is at karnak you can see how these sandstone columns were made they would stack up you know half rounds or, or blocks of sandstone uh, and then they would just rub them down and they would machine them down till they looked like a column. You can see that last column at the end here was, was never actually finished. And sandstone obviously is much softer than granite. Uh, and this is much easier than doing something in a single piece. It's a whole topic for another video and a whole other discussion. But a lot of these new kingdom temples that are built from these sandstone columns and structures are built around a granite core. And it, particularly like at Luxor, there are single piece granite columns in that core. But it's almost as if there was a pre-existing structure here that was then incorporated into a later design for a temple. Maybe there were some statues there. So, yeah, there's, there's once you start to embrace the concept of inheritance and reuse and renovation, I think a lot of what we see on these ancient sites starts to make a lot more sense. Last topic we're going to get into before we wrap this up, and this is we're going to quickly go through this, but there's one other aspect. Other than this tale of two industries, the precision, the machining, uh, there's one other aspect that I think is indicative of the use of advanced technology, and that is the logistics that's involved in moving extremely massive objects. And we have several examples for these. Uh, I, I do, I'm firmly, I firmly believe that the dynastic Egyptians were certainly capable of moving loads of 100, 150, maybe even 200 tons out in the open on a flat ground you know enough guys on a sled dragging stuff around it might have been possible i think where that really starts to stretch credibility uh, credibility and and you know believability is when you start getting up to the 400 the 600 or even the thousand ton range you know it's not just a linear scale of difficulty when you get into these sorts of massive objects material strength and failure becomes a real issue the, the friction coefficient of trying to move these things across ground just skyrockets. Uh, you just, you, and in a lot of cases, you're working in difficult environments like this case, right? This is the unfinished obelisk at Aswan, which 
which is estimated to weigh around little under 1200 tons how are you lifting this up it's on a you know it's on a gradient this thing's actually on a slope look at the environment around it how are you getting enough men in there to to come even close to being able to lift that sort of mass there's 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 clearly a point where technology has to be involved with the movement of these types of of loads and we see examples of these types of loads not only in Egypt, but across a lot of ancient sites. There are another blocks just like it uh, in the quarry at Baalbek in Lebanon. This is um, this is the shot of what they, they call st- the stone of the south or the stone of the pregnant woman, uh, roughly also probably 1,300, 1,400 tons. Uh, it was recently unearthed next to it. In fact, you can see to the left, you can see the line of where the, the bedrock and the dirt used to be. But if you actually look just below it and to the left of it, there's an even larger stone. Uh, that's approximately around the 2,000 ton mark that's found in this quarry. And these are detached from the bedrock. They're literally stacked up on top of each other. Uh, They're limestone, they're not granite, but these are just tremendous stones that, in all honesty, the the Romans who occupied this site and built the Temple of Jupiter on it probably never even knew this this other block was down here in the ground. Um, There's actually two or three of them in this quarry. This is at the, the quarry at Baalbek, just tremendous. But when, when it comes to Egypt, you know, there is actually a, a, an even bigger piece of stone. Um, it's, in a, it's in a quarry called Minya. Not many people know about this, but uh, it's, it's a limestone quarry. There has been the outline. There's two massive stones. Again, they're not detached from the bedrock. The, 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 the trenches have been dug around them. On the top of one of them, there seems to be the outline of what, I've mit- what might have been a tremendous standing statue. And there's two stones that they that they found in the quarry here, a, a smaller one and a well smaller I say, and a, and a larger one, and based on the depth of the uh, of the trenches and based on the average density of limestone in the Minya region, estimates of the weights for these two stones, the smaller one comes in at around you know 2,000 to 2,500 tons, and the larger larger one I've seen estimates of its mass up to 5,000 tons. It could post- potentially have been a 5,000 ton block that was at some point apparently going to be lifted up out of that quarry and then used for some purpose. It's just remarkable. This is not something that's achievable with you know primitive methodologies, wooden sleds and dudes yanking on it with rope. So do we, we know that these things were moved around though. They're not just in the quarry. There's plenty of evidence for 1,000 plus ton objects, uh, in particular statues. This is the, this is the Ramesseum, on the west bank of the Nile in Upper Egypt near Luxor. Uh, it's a the fallen over remnants of what once was a single piece granite statue with, funnily enough, some crudely carved hieroglyphs written onto it. That was, of course, of Ramses II. Uh, the features of the statue that are carved, you can see parts of the headdress there, are just incredibly well done. The statue reflects a lot of the same technology that we saw in some of the very fine statues at the start of the presentation. But this thing... Uh, seated on a throne as it likely was would have been around a thousand tons if not a little bit in excess of it as a single piece Uh, just the pedestal that the stone that the throne and the statue was sitting on measuring that out and going with the you know a conservative estimate on size and the 2.7 tons per cubic meter of granite uh, the pedestal alone is around 500 to 600 tons so you've got a, a 600 ton pedestal and a thousand ton statue sitting on top of it um just a huge object and although this is you know it's within a a couple hundred miles of aswan you still have to figure out how they got that granite from from aswan to this location how they shaped it how they stood it up all those things uh it's not the only thousand ton object uh obviously i'm not talking about me in the photo but rather the the foot that we're got our hands on and it's this is the only remnant of what would have been a similar size statue uh, potentially, if you think of the size of the Statue of Liberty, the the feet, the foot of this statue is about the same size as the foot of the Statue of Liberty. So, huge single piece granite statue. What's most remarkable about this um, statue is its location. This one's actually found at Tanis, which is in the Nile Delta, far to the north. You're talking about more than a thousand kilometers from the quarry. So we had a thousand plus ton. Like the finished product might have been a thousand tons the stone itself to, to get up there because it wouldn't have been sent finished it would have been sent either as a block or as a roughly carved block could have been 1500 tons plus just and you have to transport that thing more than a thousand miles to the north 
up into the, the delta at Tanis, where it would have been installed and finished. And today, all we're left with is this segment of it. It's a foot that's been repurposed uh, for a block in a wall. But this would have been a, just an incredible site. More than that, we have another example. This one's at Karnak Temple. It's not made from granite, but rather conglomerate quartzite, which you could argue is actually even a, a harder stone to work than granite. You can see the remnants of the upper arm and the hand here. This is in the the what the so-called boneyard at Karnak Temple. Conglomerate quartzite is a compressed form of, of, of sandstone. It's incredibly hard, very much like granite, but what makes it even more difficult to work is the fact that it's a conglomerate. It has chunks of flint in it, and flint's a 7.5 on the Mohs scale. In fact, flint is used to carve a lot of the other stones, yet this, this material has flint in it, and there is when you find pieces of flint on the original features of this of this statue it's evident that they had no trouble whatsoever working that flint it's it, there's no perceivable difference in how they worked the flint relative to the the quartzite uh and it's it's full of fine features particularly the thumbnail on this thing is amazing and you can compare the thumbnail to the glyph that's been carved into the scroll that's in his hand the glyph is very rough it's obviously done with hand tools and you can see these very fine features that are in uh that were carved into the thumbnail. Again, it seems like the the writing would have come much later uh, on this statue. The one other thing I like to mention about this statue is that because the arm is straight, they've put this together in recent years, the shoulder and upper arm, we know that this was in fact a standing statue. This would have been just a tremendous sight when it was when it was originally in place. I couldn't I can't even imagine it. A lot of the statues, the big ones were seated, but this was actually a standing statue. We do have some examples of how this type of load might have been moved, and we, we have one good example that I like to use and I've talked about in a couple of videos. It's the Russian Thunderstone. This was a, a large piece of granite that was moved in the 1700s from Finland. It weighed about 1,500 tons, 1,500 tons uh, when it was first moved. It was, it was worked on and quarried as it was moved. Uh, they moved it across land. They had to wait for the ground to freeze in the first place to actually get it up out of uh, its hole in a hillside in Finland. And the way they moved this thing across the ground was with a, a very complex se uh, series of these steel beams using massive bronze spheres as ball bearings. And you can kind of see them moving the ball bearings up and putting these you know, big rails in place. Uh, as they slowly winch this thing forward with deeply anchored capstans. So right here in the 1700s, this is how this type of a load was moved. On a good day, they would move this thing about 150 meters. And that wasn't every day. But you know, on a good day, they could pull it 150 meters. And right here, you're seeing just a huge amount of technology that was beyond what they say the dynastic Egyptians had. Dynastic Egyptians didn't use capstans. They didn't use pulleys. They didn't use, you know, ball bearings. They didn't use steel rails to run this thing on like this. Like, apparently, the dynastic Egyptians did much more than this with nothing more than rope, sleds, human horsepower, and wooden levers, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, the Thunderstone's a great example to study because it's it's a fairly primitive, uh, or at least, you know, non sort of hydraulic diesel-powered example of lifting or moving a load like this. It was eventually even moved across the, the Gulf of Finland to Russia, where it was it's now serves as the pedestal for a a bronze statue of Peter the First and the stone itself is now only around four to five hundred tons because it was steadily carved away into its final shape as it was moved. But this gives you an idea of what it actually takes to use to move a load like fifteen hundred tons, like like one of the unfinished statues might have been. Um, tremendously difficult, even for our civilization, only a couple of hundred years ago. So What's the mainstream explanation for how these statues were moved in ancient Egypt? Well, this is how they say it was done. This is a very famous image. It's called the Djuti Hotep image. And it is an image that was painted on uh, the tomb of the guy named Djuti Hotep. Uh, it depicts a team of something like 160, 170 guys pulling a sled with a large statue on it with somebody pouring some sort of liquid in front of it. Uh, there's no other technology there's no ropes i mean there's no capstans there's ropes uh no pulleys just manpower a bit of milk or lube on the ground in front of it and a wooden sled 
What's interesting about this image is, is that although it's used as a panacea for every you know large object like statue that was moved in ancient Egypt, we know something about this statue. Firstly, it was made from alabaster or white calcite, a much softer stone, even a less dense stone than granite. Estimates around this statue, and this comes from mainstream Egyptology, is that it probably weighed about 56 tons. 56 tons. Do I think you could move a statue like this that's 56 tons with this sort of methodology? Sure. This probably actually happened. They probably made the statue and they probably moved it like this. But under no circumstances can you use this to describe how you might shift a load of 1,000 tons or 1,500 tons, let alone two or three or 4,000 tons. It's just utterly ridiculous. Um, and anyone who understands the dynamics of you know large loads and friction coefficients and things like that will, will be able to tell you this. But this is how it's explained. So, all right. In summary, we're finally getting towards the end here. We're looking at a tale of two industries. Now, we see this tale of two industries across pyramid buildings, boxes, statues, columns, vases. Most of these advanced artifacts are also, in many cases, the oldest, which is a massive technological contradiction. How come the more sophisticated artifacts aren't the newest? Like, you think, you think technology should progress as time goes forward, but we see the opposite thing happening in dynastic Egypt. Some of these advanced artifacts stretch far back into pre-dynastic times, like the vases. They go back up to like 15,000 years ago, and then they disappear from that civilization very early on. What's going on here? How does this make any sense? We know that hieroglyphs are the bedrock of Egyptology, and they're used to date and relate artifacts into the story of history. Yet there's a significant technological delta between the glyphs and the object themselves, and we see this all over the place. We also have lots of lots of evidence for, for, for later editions of glyphs or for overwritten glyphs, for pharaohs writing their names on artifacts they clearly usurped. How can we date that artifact based on what's written on it? We've also seen that the logistics involved in moving massive objects, the evidence for machining and precision, that's far beyond the tools and the techniques of the archaeological record. Remember that the tools and techniques in the archaeological record are things like flint and copper chisels and pounding stones. Not much else. There's a mod The modern analysis that's been done recently on the granite vases is showing just an inexplicable degree of sophistication right down to the point that, well, it's a fairly strong conclusion that you might have even needed a computer and a really sophisticated manufacturing system to make them. And these conclusions are being come to by engineers, by craftsmen, by cryptographers, and in general, archaeologists are not any of those things. Uh, although, as I like to say, you know, uh, you wouldn't ask an archaeologist to design the chair that he's sitting on, but if it's an ancient chair, then he's going to claim, you know, providence over it and expertise over it. But that's not the way that it works. So what are the possible explanations for what we see? Well, one, one explanation is, and as many people claim, everything was created by the dynastic civilization. So this must mean, based on the evidence, that there was a high technology industry existing alongside a low tech one, because we have evidence for both. We have the artifacts, and we also see both of these artifacts spread across pretty much the entire period of time. So they must have existed, a high tech industry and a low tech industry at the same time. Yet, we haven't found any of the tools for the high tech process. We have found the tools for the low tech process. They didn't draw any of the scenes or leave us any descriptions or any evidence whatsoever for the high-tech process. They certainly did so for the low-tech process. We have, we have depictions of the building of mud brick pyramids. We have depictions of them making handmade alabaster vases. We have depictions of, of them moving 50-ton loads. We don't have anything that explains the other artifacts. The only other explanation, if the dynastic Egyptians didn't make everything was that they didn't and that they could not make everything. So, in that case, some artifacts, perhaps architecture, must have been inherited. Somebody must have made them. An earlier civilization must have existed at some point. A sophisticated civilization, one that utilized forms of advanced technology, which we see evidenced in the artifacts and in the achievements. This civilization, clearly we have no record of it, it's lost in time but its remnants must have been inherited and then subjected to thousands of years of renovation, of reuse, and also destruction. Remember, a lot of this stuff has just been quarried and destroyed and torn apart and reused throughout the centuries and millennia since it's been there. 
we can also ask the question, what about what do the Egyptians themselves say? Uh, well, they we talked about the king's list earlier, but there's there's actually a couple of different sources for documents that go back even further than the king's list. The king's list gives us this, you know, the list of kings from Menes of the the first um, pharaoh of the first dynasty in 3150 BC. But there are a couple of other documents like the Turin Papyrus and the Turin's King's List that go back far further. That The Turin Papyrus describes a time known as Zeptepi, the time of the gods, when the Nedaru, or the gods, walked to the earth themselves. And they, they had mystical, magical powers. These are the gods that are described in the sort of traditional Egyptian pantheon. And it's said there that they reigned for some 23,200 years. And they were followed by the Shemsu Hall, the Venerables of Shensu Hor, who were followers of Horus, again, these semi-divine kings who also displayed mystical powers, and they were said to have reigned for 13,420 years. This gives us a total of some 36,620 years before the dynastic Egyptian civilization ever started. A lot of the dynastic Egyptian history describes them as a legacy civilization, and they describe this as their history, not as some sort of myth and legend. We pretty much arbitrarily make that decision for them in our interpretation of their origin stories. Is it time to rewrite the history of civilization? Could we be looking at the remnants of two or even more civilizations that existed deep in prehistory? You have to include the concept and think about the concept of inheritance, of renovation, of reuse, of imitation when you look at these ancient artifacts. These contradictions are in plain sight. But they're very easily explained when you consider these concepts, inheritance, imitation, renovation, and reuse. There is a very clear and distinct level of technology here. There is a, a high-tech industry that seems to have existed, and there's a low-tech industry. And we have proof in the dynastic Egyptian civilization for a low-tech industry. And the high-technology objects, the sophisticated objects, obviously showing some sophisticated capability, but they do not match what we know about the dynastic Egyptians, and it doesn't seem likely that they made it. And if they didn't make them, then somebody must have. There's a tremendous amount of pressure on the standard model of history now to, to change its, its scope, that standard model of history that we started with. It's not just this evidence for ancient tech. It's coming from the discovery of recent cataclysm with the younger Dryas, New discoveries across archaeology with Gobekli Tepe, the Amazon, what's happening in Turkey, scientific advances in our own research in terms of DNA and everything else. And all of these things are vectors of change that should be shifting our perspective of our own history on this planet. And I think we have to ask ourselves here, what would it mean? What would it mean to us if we rewrote the history of human civilization on this planet? What would what would it potentially change if we went from this, this concept of you know, 6,000 years, we went from a Stone Age to a Space Age. And instead of that, we, we had a, a global shift in awareness of, of a concept of what it meant to be a human being to something more like this. Could this be a new tenant for what it means to be in modern civilization, what it means to be on, an, on a human on the planet today? If we understood that instead of being the only civilization that's ever existed, some sort of preordained linear path from the Stone Age, Stone Age that in fact we're part of some circular motion, some repeating pattern that oscillates between civilization and cataclysm. What would that mean for us? Do you think we could actually change this perception? I think it's possible. You can find a couple of examples for this. I think one in particular, whether you, you like it or you don't or you agree with it or you don't, but there's been a, a massive shift in global, the global zeitgeist and awareness when it comes to climate change. Right, it's, it's as politicized and as silly as some of that the arguments are. It's undeniable that in the last twenty or thirty years, climate change has shifted the way we think about investments, decisions, interactions with each other, interactions with the planet. It's changed our behavior. This type of change is actually possible if more people understand it, and it gets into what is ultimately the zeitgeist, the the the, the global consciousness of of human beings. And I'd certainly like to think that if this type of a shift could happen for us, then it might mean something like, you know, we spend a little less money on tanks and guns and fighting each other and maybe a little bit more money and focus on space exploration and getting out and solving some of the true long-term challenges that our civilization faces. Because on a long enough timeline, this little return to cataclysm, it's 100% guaranteed to happen again. 
and we're in a unique place in terms of civilization and technology to be able to do something about it if only we had the will and the mind to do it thank you guys for listening hope you enjoyed the presentation